Welcome everyone. This is our cafeteria managers training. We have lots and lots of people on the call today. Um, we are not going to be unmuting anyone's microphone. If you have a question, especially if it pertains to the cafeteria managers topic, type it in the, the chat box. Um, the last several meetings, we've kind of made this disclaimer we are going through this material today as if this was somewhat of a normal school year. We understand this is not a normal school year. So if you have some COVID-19 questions, if you have, how am I gonna feed my virtual students? What do I do if we have a school closures? For those questions, we're gonna kind of hold off on answering those because we can really get bogged down in those. Uh, we are having calls with schools. You may not have been a part of those. We have those every other week. Um, so those questions we will kind of keep for those. Now we've been asked several times, how do I get a, um, how do I get a certificate? What do I do if I have other people watching me, watching with me on my computer? What we do is Gary sends us a list of everyone who has registered and attended the meeting. We will set a specific amount of time that you had to stay on the call to get your certificate. The certificate, when we email those out, is blank. It has, you know, cafeteria managers, how many ever hours of training we, we get through. And you base it on the honor system you print out a certificate for those that need a certificate that have attended with you. Um, so will there be new SOPs for COVID-19? Oh, there's all kinds of standard operating procedures for, for COVID-19. Those we will discuss on the call. We will, our next call for COVID-19 will be Wednesday, August the 5th at 2.30. So we've talked about making sure you put your question in the chats. Uh, we will take periodic breaks and go through and answer those questions. We've discussed where you can go to get the handouts. The handouts are in CARS other documents under the 2021 heading the school year. You scroll down and find trainings upcoming. Open the tab that says cafeteria manager handout. Cafeteria manager handout, double click on that and it should come up as a zip file. Open the zip folder and you should be able to print the handouts or save them to your computer. And in those handouts is the PowerPoint. We have the, um, some menus from the Cooking for Kids classes. If you've attended any of those, you already have those menus, but those are out there for everyone. It's some um, sample menus. We also have the ICN website where uh, you can obtain recipes, some offer versus servant information, and some samples of production records. Also, if you need a manual, the child nutrition manual is in CARS. It's up at the top under the 2021 link. You can print it by section. So if you are the cafeteria manager and you want just the cafeteria manager section, you can print that or you can print the entire manual. There is the manuals broken up into the four sections or you can print the entire manual. Um, just a quick note, we were looking at how many meals we've served over the summer and for since March through the end of, I believe it was June, Jennifer said, you guys have served over 20 million meals to our kids in the state of Oklahoma. I wanna give you guys a big round of applause because most of you that are on this call this morning have been instrumental, but you guys have just done an outstanding job keeping every everyone uh, fed this summer and meals put out to everyone uh, just Thank you. Thank you for all the work you've done this summer. So we're going to go ahead and, and really kick off and get into the 
PowerPoint and, and the training. So this is cafeteria managers. We are going to be looking at the, the 2021 school year. This is our first ever online Zoom training for cafeteria managers and we are excited that everyone is on the call. And we're gonna look at our learning objectives, our learning objectives for today. And we hope we can get through everything and you guys will have a better understanding of the meal patterns, both breakfast and lunch and after school snacks. Kind of want to go over what is a reimbursable meal? You know, what has to be on the tray for it to be reimbursable? What is offer versus serve? Hopefully you'll have a better understanding of offer versus serve and how it works for the different grades. Understanding a special diet. What happens in your school when you have children that need a special diet? We have some tips and tools on some menu planning how to complete our food production records. We're gonna look at how to use the food buying guide. What is a CN label or a child nutrition label and why it's important in our child nutrition programs. What is the CACFP meal program and some other miscellaneous information that we need to cover. So the management of the cafeteria uh, is you guys' job. This is what's very important. And we were talking about the school meals that impact our kids every day. The 20 million meals over the summer is fabulous. We just, we just applaud you guys. But why is school meals important? Because there's still millions impacted by hunger and food insecurity every day. Even here in the state of Oklahoma where we have growing seasons and um, lots of food that's grown, but we still have food insecurities, which, but at the same time, obesity is still a concern. And that's why the uh, programs still have, still have um, calorie limits and other things on there. We probably, I just had a question pop up about civil rights. No, we will not discuss civil rights on this call today. Uh, there's a couple of different ways and we may talk about those during during a break. Our USDA meal patterns come from the 2015-2020 dietary guidelines for Americans and the my plate messages. Now on the screen you can see a website that is the website to the uh, dietary guidelines for America. Normally if we were all together, we would click on that and go out to that website and take a look at it. But on a Zoom call, uh, I don't want to mess up my PowerPoint and have to try to figure out how to get back. So we're going to just leave the website up there for a few moments. And if you need that website, we will, we can get it to you later on, or you can download the PowerPoint and have that website. Our Meal patterns offer us more um, fruits and vegetables. It help, wants us to limit the amounts of oils and um, fats and trans fats in our foods. So let's, let's dive in. Let's start talking about our meal patterns. <clears throat> we have our breakfast and lunch meal patterns. In the um, 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, we went to the one single menu approach. At that time, we had two menu approaches that schools could do, but now everyone is under the same menu approach. It makes it more simple. It allows you to offer fruits and vegetables daily. Whole grain foods are now important. Whole grain rich foods, I should say, not just whole grain. You still have to offer milk to each grade group, and we'll talk about what the grade groups are a little later. It limits our calories based on these grade groups, and we look at reducing our fats, sodium, and our trans fats in our, in our meal pattern. Matter of fact, we want to eliminate the trans fats except for the naturally occurring trans fats in our programs. 
some of the meal flexibilities that came out for last school year that are still in effect is one half of your grains have to be whole grain rich for the week. So again, this year for breakfast and lunch, your meal patterns, half of your grains have to be whole grain rich. The sodium target will not change for breakfast or lunch. We're still looking at target, the first target. Um, I'm not seeing any new memos on any other changes. So this school year, we will not have any menu meal pattern changes for the school year. Your flavored milk and low fat milk are still required. However, just make sure if you um, are offering the, the higher fat that a unflavored milk has to be offered with each meal. Uh, each meal service. Now we're going to do something a little different and with a group this large I'm not sure how our polling questions are going to work but I'm going to launch a polling question, answer the polling question in the little box that pops up not necessarily in the chat. So here comes the polling question. The polling question is we're going to talk about our grade groups. Just want to see overall out there how many of you know what the grade groups are. So, so is it number one, the K, do you do a K through four, or five through nine, nine through 12, is that an allowable grade grouping? K through five, six through 10, 11 through 12, is that a correct grade grouping? K through five, six through eight, nine through 12, is that our correct grade grouping? Or the bottom one, um, K through two, three through five, grade six through 12. If you're brand new to, to child nutrition, you're probably not going to know the answer to this question, but you will by the end of the day, or at least I hope you do by the end of the day. I'm going to give you about a minute or so to answer our polling question. Uh, polling questions are just to keep you guys awake and, and alert. Um, so we, we still have people raising their hand. Um, we're not going to that would be if you were raising your hand, would be like in class, you were wanting to talk. We're not going to unmute microphones. There's too many people on the call to um, unmute microphones and let other people talk. If you have a specific question, put it in the chat and we will take a break and uh, Sherry will jump on the call with us and we will start looking at the questions and try to answer them. All right, I'm gonna end the polling. And it looks like a majority of you, 70, I'm gonna share the results. 78% says the correct grade grouping is K through five, six through eight, nine through 12. That is correct. So if you miss that, please, please, please don't, don't stress it. We're gonna go over what those are during our presentation today so that, um, you understand for a correct grade group, it's the K through five, six through eight, nine through 12. Now there are some little caveats to that. For lunch, we can look at a grade grouping of the K through 12. For lunch, you can overlap and have a K through eight menu and a nine through 12. At lunch though, you there's not an overlapping for like the sixth through 12th grade. It has to be the ninth through 12th graders have to have their own grade grouping menu. Just not, not an option there. This slide just kind of breaks it down a little bit so you can um, kind of see the grade grouping and the calorie ranges at lunch and at breakfast. So if you're uh, doing a K through eight, six, a K through eight menu, you see down at the calorie overlaps at breakfast, you can overlap. But what happens when you use that K through eight menu is you're actually shorting those seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders a little bit on the calories and bumping up a little bit on the calories for the K through five guys. That's the only difference and you, you need to pay attention because maybe you want your eighth graders to have a few more calories. So it could be more beneficial to you to break the menu down into three groups. 
It doesn't mean you have to offer different menu items. It's how much of that menu item that you are going to be putting out there for those students. And you see the calorie ranges for the ninth through 12th graders. Breakfast is uh, the 450 to 600, lunch 750 to 850. Again, at lunch, there's no overlapping. So the ninth through 12th graders have to have their own menu plan. Okay, I'm not advancing as well as I would like to. My clicker for some reason is not working this morning. Probably need new batteries, but anyway. Specific nutrient standards is, like I said, you have your calories, you have your upper and lower limits. So if you're not doing a nutrient analysis on your own menu, you're just having to guess at this. Um, there is a USDA tool that would help you to, um, help you to know if you are meeting these target goals. USDA has not had us from the State Department to do a nutrient analysis the last couple of years, but that could change in the, at any year. Um, your saturated fat, you cannot have, you should have less than 10% of your total fat in saturated fat. Sodium for each grade group, there is that target and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and our trans fats, you really want zero trans fats. If you're buying um, items that still show trans fats on that nutrition label, those need to be gotten rid of and you need to, um, maybe this is an opportunity to put in that procurement on those specifications that to make sure your items that you are going to prospectively buy from uh, your vendor is zero trans fats. Now, one thing I did fail to mention, and if you see the little blue boxes with a page number in them like this slide has CM8. Those numbers in those blue boxes correspond to our child nutrition manual. So that's going to be in the cafeteria manager section on page eight. This is our lunch meal pattern. Um, normally, if we were meeting in person, this would be a handout we would give you on a little card stock. But now this may be something you, if you don't have one from previous years, it has not changed since last year. Um, you could print this out, laminate it yourself and hang it in your, in your kitchen. What I want to bring your attention to here is that um, it's got the meal pattern broken down and you can see the K through five, six through eight, nine through 12. The items that we have highlighted in the yellow in the parentheses is what is required to be offered daily. What is to the left of those parentheses is the weekly requirements. So let's look. In the meal patterns, you have five components you have for the lunch meal pattern. You have fruit, vegetable, grain, meat, and milk. Those are our five components. Now fruit for our K through five children, they have to be offered every day a half a cup of fruit. For the week, they have to be offered a minimum of two and a half cups. So you look at your six through eight, it's exactly the same because remember those two could overlap. And the only thing that was a little different is our um, calories and our sodium that you have to um, adjust down if you're going to do the overlapping menu. But look at your ninth through 12th graders. They have to be offered one cup of fruit every day, five cups for the week. Um, the cups of fruit and you see the little B out beside that, there's going to be some footnotes and we're, we're going to look at the footnotes in just a moment. Couldn't fit the whole sheet of paper as one slide because we wanted to try to make it as large as possible so that you could be able to view it on the, on the screen. Now, when we're looking at the vegetables, you notice there's those um, indented dark green, red, orange, those are what we refer to as the subgroups for the vegetables. 
Now on your vegetables, you notice that your K through eight children have to be offered three quarters of a cup of vegetable every day and three and three quarters cup over the week. Your high school or your ninth through 12th graders have to be offered one cup of vegetable per day with five cups over the week. And we're gonna get into each of the subgroups um, and how they work a little bit later in the presentation. But you can see each day, cause they're, um, I'm sorry, for the week, each subgroup has its own requirement. So offering a dark green, your K through five children have to be offered throughout, sometime during that week, a half a cup. The same way with your sixth through eighth graders, they have to be offered a half a cup. Well, dark green is the same for all, grade, all grades. Your red orange, that is what I wanna bring your attention to. Your K through five, six through eight have to be offered three quarters of a cup over the week. But your high schoolers have to be offered at least a cup and a quarter throughout the week. And then beans are the same throughout the week for all grades, starchies the same. And then the other vegetable group um, have to be a half a cup and a half a cup for your K through five, your six through eight, and then three quarters of a cup for your high schoolers. Then going on down, uh, you have to have some more vegetable because if you added all these subgroups up, you're gonna realize that's not enough to meet that weekly total. So you have to offer some additional, and it can be from any of the subgroups to meet the total that's required for the week. We find during, when we're out doing administrative reviews, this is where we sometimes see some issues is the vegetable subgroups of not offering enough of those subgroups during the week. And we've got a tool that kind of helps with that in the manual. Um, and I tell the story, and if you've been in any of my workshops, you've, you've heard me tell, I'm, I'm a previous food service director. I was a director when the meal patterns changed and I, I can remember the day sitting in the McAllister cafeteria when um, the state and OSU Extension came in to do our first meal pattern training. And I had the thought, I will never figure out these subgroups. And I was fortunate enough in my office, I had a huge whiteboard. I took my whiteboard and I went and bought a red marker, a green marker, a brown marker, uh, a pink marker, and assigned them to, you know, the green for my green leafy vegetables, my red marker for my red orange, and put my menu up on this whiteboard and started filling it in. And then I, I'm a very visual learner. You know, some people are not visual learners, but I'm a visual person. Once I had those subgroups up there throughout the whole week and my menu plan, I could see what was missing. Very color coded. Um, that's what it takes to make sure you get that. So when we're there doing a review, we're not writing up and finding you in non-compliance and taking back meals, taking back money for meals. That's why it's so important that you guys understand in the field that this is a part of our program that's so important to USDA that if you're not following these meal patterns that you can actually lose money or money can be taken back for those meals. Uh, so we will continue on with those grade groups. And as you can see the grains, there are um, your K through five and your six through eight have to be offered one ounce equivalent grain per day, eight for the week. So obviously you can't offer just one ounce of grain every day to get to the eight for the week. You have to offer a couple more throughout the week. Your grades nine through 12 have to be offered two ounce equivalent servings of grain, 10 for the week. That's very important. Make sure um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about bread sizes and how to use the bread grain chart as we go through the presentation today. 
um, your fluid milk, everyone has to be offered a cup of milk every day with every meal. The only exception is your after school snack program. There is some flexibility there. Our minimum calories, you can see those. The K through five has 550 to a maximum of 650. If remember, these are all for lunch. A six through eight, 600 calories to 700 calories. Our ninth through 12th graders or 750 calories to 850. You can see the saturated fat there is all less than 10%. And our sodium target at lunch, we're staying with this target number one. So your K through eight, you're trying to hit a target of 1,230 cal uh, milligrams of sodium per day. Your six through eight is your 1,360. And your high schoolers, 1,420. Those are, are very important that if you're not doing a nutrient analysis, you're not sure, but if you're working on buying lower sodium vegetables and paying attention to the sodium in the items that you are ordering from your vendors, that is very, very beneficial. These are the footnotes uh, that I was talking about. Very important uh, that you read those, what they correspond to. It gives you a little more information on those meal patterns. Make sure you are reading over those that uh, I notice on C, it says larger amount of these vegetables may be served. In other words, on your vegetable subgroups, those are the minimums. You can offer more on your, actually on any of the components, but you wanna make sure it can meet in the nutrients uh, that you're not going over on your calories and your sodium, because that's very, very important. The sub uh, footnote F talks about half of your weekly grains have to be whole grain rich. And we're gonna go through some of the definitions of what a whole grain rich item is. So make sure you're paying attention to those footnotes. Here is our breakfast meal pattern. It is set up just like the lunch meal pattern. If it's in the parentheses, that's your daily total. To the left of the parentheses is your weekly total. So for fruits, for all grades, as you can see there, you have to offer one cup per day with five through the week. And I didn't say this on the lunch, but both meal patterns, you can offer juice, but juice can only count for half of the servings per week. And we have a slide on that, but I, I wanna say that here, so we maybe say that a couple of times. We find that is sometimes written up in the reviews when our consultants come out to do an administrative review, that you've only offered juice at breakfast. Um, which you can offer a whole cup of juice at breakfast, but only half of that can be for the week. So you still would have to, you could only offer two and a half cups of juice per week in the breakfast program or the lunch program. The rest would have to come from fresh, frozen, or canned. Now you see on the slide, the vegetables, they're all zeros. You are not required to serve a vegetable at, lunch, at breakfast. You can, but you are not required. Breakfast, you can see the grain requirement there. One whole grain, or one, I shouldn't say one whole grain, one grain per day, one ounce equivalent of grain per day. For your K through five, you have to have a weekly minimum though of seven ounce grain equivalents per week. Six through eight, has to have a minimum of eight. Your ninth through 12th grade has to have a minimum of nine. Now, if you're gonna follow that K through 12 breakfast, you're gonna have to offer at least the maximum for your high school. So you're gonna want to offer nine ounce equivalents of grain per week. The calories, um, and as you can see there on the screen, the calories, you would have a lower limit and an upper limit limit, saturated fat again, trans fats, again, we're trying to totally do away with your trans fats, except for naturally occurring, of course. And then your sodium targets there at breakfast. Um, 
you're trying to hit a target for your K through five of less than 540 milligrams of sodium per day, less than 600 on your sixth through um, eighth graders, and less than 640 at breakfast for your high school, your sixth, your ninth through 12th graders. And again, the footnotes here for um, the breakfast meal patterns, you would want to look at those and um, study those so that you can have those in mind when you are preparing your meal. Now we want to talk a little bit about our shorter and longer weeks. Um, if you have a shorter week, it doesn't change the daily requirement. And you, oh, well, there's a little typo. I didn't go back and find the page number for that. I apologize. I'll try to correct that and, and we'll re-put that um, information back out for you guys. Um, I know Sherry has her manual and uh, maybe for our question and answer, she can have that page number for us for our shorter and longer weeks. But again, the daily requirement does not change. The weekly requirement would, of course, because you're going a shorter or a longer week. The vegetable subgroups differ a little bit at lunch on your shorter and longer weeks. So if you have a shorter or longer week, um, you would want to go in in our manual and look and see what the meal pattern you would need to follow. And I, I said that we wouldn't really answer questions about COVID, but I am going to answer a little a question here that came up several times in our COVID um, call last week. If you're going to have a virtual day and do distance learning, but that's an accredited school day, you're still going to be a five day a week school. So if you're offering lunch five days to those children, they're not, um, that's, you're still going to be following the five day meal pattern. Only time you're going to look at doing a shorter week is if your school district says, I'm just a four day school week. That's all we're having. We're not having a virtual day, we're not having distance learning day, whatever, um, because you will be feeding, or I shouldn't say you will be, you may be feeding your virtual students or your distance learning students through the COVID this year. So what is a reimbursable meal? A reimbursable meal means that the number of required components are on that child's tray. That's where we, get our money from. So if you're a, normally a kitchen person and you may not understand that the reason behind why we say all these components have to be there, um, that's where our money comes from. That's what you're paid on is a reimbursable meal. So that's why it's very, very important that the required components are on the tray and that they are on the tray and planned in the correct sizes. That's why we talked about the meal patterns, especially fruit has to be offered in a whole cup or a half a cup. Um, it's not what the child picks up, it's what is planned. So keep that in mind. Someone has to monitor that meal as it leaves the serving line to ensure that the right components are on there. Milk is very important that milk is offered in the right portion at the right meal. And all of your documentation, you keep to back up what you've served, your production records, your invoices, um, how you've claimed for reimbursement, that you offered the unflavored milk at each meal service. We're gonna talk about the dietary substitutions a little more and go over what is required if you have a child who needs a special, special meal. So let's talk about our lunch components. And we mentioned on the um, other slide and on Child Nutrition Manual pages CM8 was our lunch components. But here's our components. You have your fruit, your vegetable with your five subgroups, grains, meat, meat alternate, and milk. 
all five of these have to be offered to every student. All five components must be offered to every student for it to be a reimbursable meal. Now we'll get into if you're not offer versus serve or offer versus serve, the differences there. So let's start talking about our fruit component. Fruit components have to be offered daily. There is a weekly minimum serving sizes that must be offered for our different grade groups. There's no upper limit except for the juice consideration. And like I said, no more than a half of the fruit offering per week can be from 100% juice. The minimum serving size that you can credit as a component is one eighth of a cup. So you may have an, an eighth of a cup in a CN label uh, or in a product formulation statement that you are allowed to count toward the component. You can, um, as long as you can watch your calories, you can offer more on the fruit, it, as long as you're not exceeding your calories. And then that last little bullet talks about a quarter cup of dried fruit equals a half a cup of fruit as a component because of the water that they've pulled out to dry the fruit. I tell my funny story. I have missed that somewhere as a director long years ago and remember when we received the craisins and it came in and it said uh, a quarter cup and I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to give them all two of these little boxes of craisins to count for a half a cup of fruit and then one of my managers uh, helped me remember that dried fruit credits more than because the cost on that was was pretty extensive. So let's look at our, our fruit just in a, a little different way here so that you really um, get a good clear picture that you your K through eight students need a half a cup a day at lunch, two and a half cup of, over the week. And I know this sounds maybe kind of redundant to some of you, but like I said, this is still an area that we find in non-compliance when we come out to do a review. So we really, really want to hammer home the meal patterns. What is required to be on that tray? What is required to be on that line every day? at lunch and breakfast. So your sixth through eighth graders need a half a cup every day, two and a half cups per week. Your ninth through 12th graders need one cup every day or five cups per week. Now our vegetable component, you could offer daily and the weekly minimums. The minimums must be offered. You can offer more, but you wanna make sure on your calories that you're not going over your of a cup to credit. If you're going to offer vegetable juice, and we do have some good vegetable juices out there that the kids seem to really like. I don't like one of them, the juice, they don't know it's a vegetable juice, but you can only offer it um, in the um, a half of a juice can, can credit for the week. And then keep in mind on the leafy, raw leafy greens, it takes a whole cup to credit a half a cup. The caveat here is making sure the menu planner communicates with your frontline staff to know what, you know, if you're gonna serve a half a cup, that is only gonna credit the fourth a cup. So if they're wanting you to serve the whole cup, to credit as that half cup vegetables. Make sure that you guys are communicating with each other so that when we come in to do a review, the production record example may say half cup of salad mix. And so you as the frontline cook, you only put out a half a cup. We come in to do the review, there's only a half a cup of serving of that lettuce on the line and we say, well, that credits a fourth a cup. Where is your other fourth a cup of green leafy for the week? You may be short and that could cause um, 
reclaiming of some, some funds at this point. So make sure you guys are communicating that. And this is just a slide that kind of brings the vegetables and the subgroups out a little bolder. Your K through five on your dark green, six through eight, nine through 12, everyone has to be offered that half a cup of dark green through the week. Red, orange, you can see at a glance there that it's three quarters cups for your K through five, six through eight, and then a cup and a quarter for your high schoolers. Legumes, a half a cup minimum for the week. Starchy, half cup for everyone. Other, you have to offer a half cup through your K through five, your six through eight, and then three quarters of a cup for your ninth through 12th graders. Your, uh, and like I said earlier, you have to come up with a few more vegetables to meet the, week, the weekly requirement. And something that I learned, and I think some of the consultants teach this as well, for those K through five, six through eight, three quarters of a cup is a lot of vegetable to serve if you're only offering one vegetable. It's real easy to break that up into serving at two one half cups because remember you can serve more vegetable. You just have to meet the minimum. So um, two half cups is easier to break up, especially if you're an offer versus serve school because um, then that gives them a choice. Because if you only offer three quarter cup of broccoli, first of all, that's a lot of broccoli. Second of all, if the kids aren't eating the broccoli, they're just throwing it away anyway. It could save you, if you're off of versus serve, it could save you money and it gives the children a choice. Um, you have broccoli and a salad. They might pick up the salad where they're gonna leave the broccoli on the line. Just kind of something to think about. Um, and in McAllister, we did do our nutrient nutrient analysis of our menus and the one cup even at the k through five six through eight grades uh, could still meet all my nutrient requirements serving or offering that whole cup of vegetable per day this whole slide's just been in there a while it just gives you some um, vegetable subgroups what categories they're in where they fall at if you um, have questions on some of those. They're highlighted the starchy vegetables because some people don't realize corn, maybe green peas are starchy. Um, other vegetables is, you know, green beans is highlighted because some people think green beans is a dark green, which it is not just because the nutrients in the green beans um, are not as, um, are not the same as what is a green leafy dark green vegetable. And then here is just um, an interesting little slide with some dark greens. I do have a disclaimer on here because your food buying guide lists your vegetables, how they are, dark green, red, orange, uh, beans, peas, and legumes. I could not find in the food buying guide the agru agrula, that M-I-Z-U-N-A, um, the, what other one was it? The Mizu, ta, the Mizu, where's, let me look at my slide here a minute. Um, this M-I-Z-U-N-A, I could not find. The one next to it, the T-A-T-S-O-I, those are not in the, well, neither was the dandelion in the food buying guide at all, at all, couldn't find them. So it wasn't like they were in the other vegetable subgroup uh, or starchy or dark green. They were just not in the food buying guide. So that's my disclaimer for that slide. Now, what is in it? What is in our red orange? Red orange probably is one of the harder groups to have some variety in for the kids. Um, some things that fit in there, though, are the acorn squash, butternut squash, carrots, we all know, we, you know, 
through the COVID crisis. I think carrots was one of the, you know, the pre bag carrots was one of the things we heard um, was maybe not as plentiful as they could be. A Hubbard squash pumpkin. Um, there are some recipes out there that you can use pumpkin in. Red peppers, red bell peppers. Um, I hear kids all the time say, well, I don't like peppers. A red pepper has a sweet flavor. So that might be an option to offer to your kiddos when they are cost effective. Sweet potatoes, I know we have our sweet potato fries. Try baking sweet potatoes. Find some recipes that are um, out there with our sweet potatoes. Then of course, tomatoes. Make sure if you're running short on your red orange vegetable through the week, that you're counting the red orange that you put in um, your pizza sauce, your spaghetti sauces, things like that. That can help make sure you're meeting those requirements. Beans, peas, and legumes. Here's just some um, samples of the beans, peas, and legumes. Because uh, if you're only feeding them um, free fried beans once a week, maybe, you know, try something new. I know if you've been through some of the cooking for kids classes, they have some new recipes and things with our, you know, what's required um, using some different varieties of things. Garbanzo beans, navy beans, black beans, pinto beans. Oklahoma, you know, we're pinto bean people. Some of the starchy, Oklahoma, we don't have a problem reaching our starchy vegetables because we have our french fries, our potatoes, um, and corn. It's not just corn on the cob. Corn in general is, is our starchy vegetable. The baby lima beans are the split peas. And just some other vegetable in the other vegetable category. Our onions, our green beans, beets, Brussels sprouts. So just some some samples of some things that are in our other vegetable category. Then kind of our, just our funny slide. These are not vegetables. These cannot be counted um, because they are a processed item and you cannot credit those as a vegetable. Now we're gonna go with our, our polling question. So let me um, launch our next polling question. Maybe. All right, launching our polling question, the question is, all of the following are a part of the red orange vegetable except one. Which one of these vegetables is not a part of our red orange? So we have carrots, sweet potatoes, beets, and pumpkins. So you guys use the, uh, that I'm going to check in my phone. Sherry's been sending me some message, some questions. And we will look at all, most of these questions that she is asking, that you guys are asking in the chat. Yes, it is being recorded. Gary does record all of our um, Zoom meetings. We will talk about field trips. We'll talk about the pre-K meal pattern a little bit later. We will talk about offer versus serve. Uh, but not civil rights so, so much in here. So let's end our polling question. It looks like the majority of you did say beets. That is correct. That was on our slide. Beets is in our other category. So very good. 87% of you said beets. Remember, sweet potatoes and pumpkins are a part of the red-orange vegetable. 
if you're new to child nutrition though, I know that it, it can seem kind of strange. Okay, now we're gonna talk about our grain component at lunch. Schools must offer um, your daily and weekly minimum servings of whole grain rich products. You have to um, have that daily and weekly minimum. And we're gonna look at those ounce equivalents to, that have to be offered. Uh, and like we were talking about, some days you have to offer more than just a one ounce serving to meet those minimums, especially in that K through five, six through eight meal patterns. And the smallest amount that you can count toward the grain component is a quarter of an ounce serving. So here on the screen is our daily minimums and our weekly minimums. And you see on the right side there, the weekly minimums, it has eight to nine. This is a slide actually from ICN, the Institute for Child Nutrition, and it still has it in eight to nine. There is no uh, upper limit. You can serve over, you just can't serve under the minimum requirement. And then and half of your grains at lunch must be whole grain rich. So identifying what is a whole grain rich item. Kind of the rule of three is if the first ingredient on that ingredient label is, is a whole grain, the other grains must be enriched. If that individual grain serving provides eight grams or more of whole grain per serving, or if you have a child nutrition label or a product formulation statement that certifies that that menu item is a whole grain rich item. Our newer um, CN labels, and um, I'm gonna see if Sherry will make a note to type this in the chat as we go, that to check for CN labels, if you go to www.fns.usda.gov forward slash CND forward slash CNLABELING forward slash. That takes you where you can look to see if a particular item you're looking for has a child nutrition label. And we will talk about CN labels and product formulation statements just a little bit later. So when looking for ounce equivalents on your baked goods, your breads, your biscuits, your bagels must contain 16 grams of credible grain to provide a one ounce equivalent. If you're looking at your cereal, it's 28 grams or one ounce by weight. If it's a pasta, it has to be a half a cup of cooked or to provide, not or, to provide a one ounce equivalent. Ready to eat cereal has to be 28 grams or one ounce to provide a one ounce equivalent. And then if your cereals are flakes or rounds, that has to be a whole cup volume size if it is a puff cereal, it has to be one and a quarter cups. So not all cereal is the same, not all bread is the same. Here is just a slide that shows some of the items that you could use to meet this whole grain rich requirement. On the right hand side, you see you know, some things in your salads. Maybe you're gonna use um, some whole grains in your soups or casseroles, kind of you're trying to hide it from the kids, so to speak. Uh, you're gonna use some noodles that are made with buckwheat flour as the primary ingredient. Some of the others on the left, just your ready to eat cereal is whole grain. Some bagels, pancakes, um, pita pockets, cornbread. These may be whole grain rich items you would need to investigate to make sure. The first thing we're gonna do is look at the whole grain stamp. 
do not trust the whole grain stamp necessarily to make it to be the, your whole grain uh, item. Now we're gonna look at another polling question. I don't wanna say I tried to trick you on this one, but I maybe tried to trick you on this one. So we're gonna look, oh, I've gotta give you the slide so you can look at the slide. Okay, we're gonna launch this poll. This biscuit that we're looking at, is this biscuit a whole grain rich item? This biscuit says its first ingredient is water, whole wheat flour, enriched flour, bleached wheat flour, malted barley flour, and then niacin iron and some other things. Then we have its nutrient facts over here that says this biscuit is a 56 gram, um, 200 calories, calories from fat is 80. So just looking at this biscuit, is this biscuit a whole grain rich item? Give you about a minute or so to answer the question. Some of you are saying yes, and some of you are saying no. We're, we're about at a 50-50 tie, this biscuit, kind of like a horse race. You guys can't see the polling question, but as you're answering yes or no, it's like two little blue lines going across. And right now, it's, it's a very close race if this is a whole grain rich biscuit or not. Okay, so now we're going to I'm gonna leave it another minute. I still see people answering yes and no. Okay, it looks like about 500 of you, about 700 that are on the call have answered the question. So that means, that tells me that maybe some of you are not answering the question. You guys are still answering, so I'm gonna leave it up just a little bit longer. And I can see the ones of you that are uh, watching as a group, you guys are all discussing. Can we count this? Can we not? Is this biscuit really a whole grain biscuit? All right, we're gonna stop. I'm gonna end the polling. And it's, I want you to look at the the result, 51 of you say, yeah, no, this is not a whole grain biscuit. And 49% of you say, yes, it is a whole grain rich biscuit. Well, it is a whole grain rich biscuit. And like I said, it's kind of a trick question because its first ingredient was water. Whole grain rich if the first ingredient is water and the next ingredient is a whole grain and the other grains are enriched, then that can be a whole grain rich item. Sorry I tricked you guys, um, but I wanted, you know, sometimes when you get tricked a little bit, it helps you remember something. So as you go forward, just remember it can start, the first ingredient can be water but it, that can be the only other thing other than whole, a whole grain. And remember there's whole grain wheat flour and there's other whole grain flours out there. And there's a list of those in our manual. Now, um, this slide says, is all bread the same? Well, actually, no, not all bread is the same. And um, if you remember, I said bread, biscuits, um, bagels had to have 28 grams, have, has to weigh 28 grams or one ounce to be credited as a one ounce serving. And as you can see, this bread, um, one slice only weighs 26 grams. So one slice of this bread would not credit a one ounce serving. You would either have to serve two slices to get at least one and a half ounce bread serving, or you would have to put something else with it. Now, is this bread a whole grain rich item? Yes, because its ingredients start with whole wheat flour, water enriched 
wheat flour, malted barley. So the other grains in it are enriched and its first ingredient is a whole grain. Um, I know one time, and I had on my specifications that my bread needed to weigh one ounce. I didn't realize my hot dog bun, because I thought, well, a hot dog a hamburger bun weighed two ounces. I never paid attention to what my hot dog buns weighed. So I was actually shorting my high school students because the hot dog bun only weighed 1.75 ounces. So make sure you guys that are checking in groceries, um, sometimes our vendors like to do substitutions. If they substitute a, your bread for a different bread, first of all, make sure it weighs the same or at least enough to count how you're gonna count it in your meal pattern and the cost of that bread if they're doing substitutions. So if they substituted this bread for a bread that you normally get that weighs 28 grams, this bread is actually gonna cost you way more because you're gonna to have to offer two slices to count for your one ounce bread serving. Now let's look at our, our grain requirement chart or exhibit A. You can find the exhibit A in our manual. You can find it in, um, on the food buying guide. So there's a couple of places I would have this printed out because it's a very handy chart. It's on page CM41 and then 42 because it's a two page um, chart. Look at your group. The groupings are basically done by how much flour and, and or sugar is in that particular item. Obviously, the more dense the item, the less sugar that's in it, the less it has to weigh to credit for an ounce equivalent of grain. So if you're looking at croutons, pretzels, a pretzel would only have to weigh 22 grams or 0.8 ounces to count as a one ounce equivalent grain serving. Then you move on to group B, which is a bigger group, of course, but our bagels, our biscuits, our sliced bread, our hot dog buns, our hamburger buns, crackers, uh, English muffins, these are ounce per ounce equivalent. So a 28 grams or one ounce credits a one ounce serving. Now look at our next group, our group C. We have our cookies, our cornbread, corn muffins, pancakes. If you're looking at that, you can see for to credit one ounce, a pancake must weigh at least 34 grams or 1.2 ounces. So a one ounce pancake doesn't credit a one ounce serving. Keep that in mind. And then you know, if you go to group D, you can see we're getting more sweet items. So they have to weigh more to credit for the grain. So if you're serving a donut, cereal bar, muffins, a, a muffin is going to have to weigh 55 grand, have 55, weigh 55 grams or two ounces to credit as a one ounce equivalent in our uh, bread grains. Then the back side, of course, we get, you know, cereal bars, donuts that are caked or frosted, sweet rolls, toaster pastries that are frosted. Uh, those have to weigh 69 grams or 2.4 ounces. You keep going down, skip on down to group G, a brownie. A brownie to credit a one ounce serving has to weigh 4.4 ounces. That's a brownie of about that big. That's a huge brownie. Group H, we talk have our cereals. So um, our cereals, one ounce credits for one ounce or 28 grams. Or if it's a pasta, it's a half a cup of cooked pasta. And then of course our ready to eat breakfast cereals, it's one cup for flakes and rounds. If it is a puff cereal, that um, cereal must weigh 1.25 ounces to credit for a, um, or it must be 1.25 cups or one ounce to credit for a one ounce serving. And for granola, a quarter cup or one ounce credits for a one ounce serving. And then this is just a flow chart that can be found in your food buying guide. Um, you can kind of read if the ingredient is this, then that item is a whole grain. If it's not, 
you know, this is where you follow some steps. Um, and if you ever have a question on a whole grain rich item, please reach out to your consultant. And I probably should have said this at the very first. If you don't know who your consultant is, look in the manual on page C3, I believe it is. It's where we list all of our consultants, their telephone numbers, their um, email addresses. Those are there. Uh, they're there as a resource for you. It's a lot better to ask a question before a review situation than it is to get into a review situation and it be too late to ask the question. On those sweet items we were talking about in our school meal program, schools can only count two ounces per week of a grain-based dessert. So those items on that um, grain chart in those groups with the higher sugars that are considered a dessert and kind of the rule of thumb, if it looks like a dessert, talks like a dessert, tastes like a dessert, it's probably a dessert, um, can only be counted, um, to, can only serve two ounces per week. And remember, since we've gone back to only half of your grains have to be whole grain rich, there's no more serving a sweet item and counting it as an extra in the meal program. All grains count toward that weekly total of grains. So keep that in mind if you're the menu planner and you're planning a menu and you're used to throwing a cookie in every Friday that wasn't a whole grain, that is now going to be counted as part of those um, weighing against your grains being whole grain rich for the week. Now, we haven't talked much about our pre-K students. Our pre-K, if you're serving pre-K, and there's a little caveat here, if your pre-Kers are mixed in, co-mingled with all of your other students, you can, they can follow the National School Lunch and Breakfast Program. If your pre-K students are not co-mingled, they come into the cafeteria or they eat in their classroom. And this year, if we're feeding more breakfast and lunch in our classrooms, you're going to have to follow the CACFP and what that stands for, if you're not familiar, Child and Adult Care Food Program. You'll have to follow those meal patterns for those pre-K students. It's actually, a, it's less food, so you, maybe wouldn't be wasting quite as much food to follow this CECA pattern, but you can't, there's a couple of things. You can't offer any sweet items. They're not allowed any sweet grains. Um, they are not allowed to offer them chocolate milk or any flavored milk. I shouldn't just say chocolate milk. They cannot be offered flavored milk. And then there's a couple other um, things we have to look at on the sugars in their yogurt and their cereals. This slide just kind of is talking about some grain components to keep you, to kind of get you thinking. If you're um, offering a chicken burrito, even if you're making it from scratch or you're buying a pre-made chicken burrito, you want to look at how much bread grain is on that, in that item. So if you have that CN label, it should tell you this chicken burrito credits 1.5 either grains or whole grain rich for the child nutrition program. If you're making it from scratch, of course, you're going to use your tortilla, you would know how much that grain would credit and um, brown rice. But let's say you made your chicken burrito from scratch and you used a regular flour tortilla. So this meal may have one and a half ounce of regular grain and one ounce of brown rice. It's a total grain of two and a half ounces, but only that one ounce would count toward your whole grain rich for the day. Kind of the same way with spaghetti. If you're not using the whole grain pasta and you're making a whole wheat roll, uh, your total grains for that day may be two and a quarter, but only a three quarter ounce equivalent is whole grain rich. Um, rice peel if you're using a whole grain rice for your pilaf, that could credit as one ounce of whole grain rich. Oatmeal cookie, of course you can't offer the cookie, as we just said to those pre gate students if they're not co-mingled, but that could count towards your grain equivalent for the week. 
Um, we're going to stop right here and take a little bit of a break. I've got 1014. So we've been uh, talking quite strongly for about an hour and a half. Um, we are going to go through and answer some questions and then we will take about a, a um, 15 minute break, give everyone time to go get something to drink, give me some time to go get something to drink and um, that. So Sherry, I'm, I'm going to let you unmute your mic and I'm going to look at some of the questions you sent and um, you can start answering some of our questions. Okay. Um, I think that later on, the questions are going to, there was one person who asked about the questions. They're basically, they're in your chat. So make sure you know they're in your chat. Um, if you are serving a group of children that are seventh through ninth grade, they want to know how does that work on serving sizes. You're going to have to follow um, the meal patterns as far as that's concerned. You're going to have to have the six through eight and the nine through 12 meal patterns with those children. Am I correct, Dana, on that one? They're going to have to that follow that. That is correct. That. That, as yeah, far you as that's concerned. Figure out a way. And um, one of the things we did in our district, we just talked with that principal and made sure one of those grade levels, the eighth, and, you know, the one of the grade levels, just make sure that those ninth graders come in there later, possibly, or earlier. You can serve them either first or last, and then you add the components or take away the components that you need to, as far as that's concerned. Um, we had a lot of questions right. regarding juice versus fruit. Okay, you have to offer a full cup of fruit at breakfast. The, the juice can only be offered half during the week. No matter what grade level you're working at, no matter what, it's K through 12 as far as that's concerned. Juice, mu you must have one full cup of fruit, but only half of that can be offered in juice. That question came up several times. Another thing too, you were asking me regarding, I did put the website for the CN labeling. It is in the chat. Also too, for those okay, of you who are you. asking about short weeks and long weeks, I also put that as on CM30 and CM31 in our 2021 20, version of our child nutrition manual. Um, also too, it's, we had a lot of questions regarding virtual students. We're not requiring you to feed virtual students. That is actually up to your school. But is that- Wait, is that wait, wait, wait. No. No. That is a question that? we've asked USDA if, if you are required to feed the virtual okay. students. That one we are not, because here's the thing, if you're participating in the National School Lunch Program and we don't want to call it a virtual day, a distance learning day, those children are still even though they're not in your building, they are, that's still an accredited school day and child nutrition programs say you feed meals on accredited school days. And that is a question we have at USDA if you have to offer meals to your distance learning students on those days. Okay, and then um, let me think, of one of the other questions was regarding, I think you're going to go into meal patterns for pre-K, aren't you going to touch on that? Yes. Um, they, yes. they were, okay, they were just asking about chocolate milk and um, they would, if they still weren't able to drink chocolate milk as far as that's concerned. Um, well, on the chocolate milk, remember everyone that, um, if the children are not co-mingled, then no, they cannot have flavored milk. If they are co-mingled, then you feed them the regular K through five meal pattern. Okay, and um, Dana, actually there's more questions that have come into the chat box since I started talking with you. Those are, I think, are the main ones um, I've highlighted. And um, as far as that's concerned that that were asked, you know, in the chat. I, uh, and, that I don't think there's anything else that really we need to cover. And here's what we will do. We've done this for all of our other Zoom meetings. We will take all of these questions and we will type them up in a Q&A type format and we will post them when we uh, post the, um, the video. 
Okay. So if you ask a question and you need that immediate answer, I would reach out to my consultant. If you need an immediate answer on, or my pre-K, you know, can I consider them commingled or not? Reach out to your consultant and ask that question. If you need, like I said, if you need an immediate answer, let's reach out to them. If not, we are going to be, um, okay, somebody, I see a question. Somebody said a black bean brownie counted as uh -huh. a vegetable. Those are the new ones. That's a new one. Um, if it looks like a dessert, talks like a dessert, and eats like a dessert, it's a dessert. Uh, we would have to we would have to discuss the black bean brownie. Maybe you need to make me a black bean brownie because I don't like beans. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but let's um, we're going. Sherry's going to look at some more some more questions. I have about 1020. We're going to, um, let me move my chat over and I can kind of get, look at some of these new. I noticed there was some on the short and long weeks. Remember what I said, if your school is a five day school week, then you're going to be using the five day week menu. And someone's asked, can we, serve virtual meals to those students on Monday for all five days. Yes, if your school is totally going distance learning, there is some waivers available that you will be able to send all five meals home with the student on Monday. The caveat to that is we are feeding these children now under the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program. So you will be claiming them in if you are a regular counting and claiming school, you will be counting them in the free, reduced, or full paid categories. So it's not like you can just feed everyone for free. If you are still raising your hand, remember we're not unmuting microphones. Uh, we have over 700 folks on the call, so that would just really be too, too confusing. Um, so if you have a question, type it in the chat box. We may not get all those answered. We may try to run through at the end of the day and look at any of the questions and uh, see if there's you know, one that we feel we need to answer. But if not, we will do a Q&A. Or like I said, reach out to your consultant if you need an immediate answer. If you are going to be offer versus serve this year, can you have do you have to offer chocolate milk or can you just stay with white milk only? You have to offer two varieties of milk. That is your choice. You could offer 1% uh, in the white and skim in the white, or you could offer 2% in the white and 1% in the white. Uh, you can, will your children drink just the white milk? Don't they like the, the chocolate milk a little bit more? Um, so that might be something you look at as what, what your children are going to drink. A question, a dessert can be served to pre-K as long as it's not. That is true. Um, you can, you know, there is in the CACFP meal pattern that you can offer that as an extra. It just cannot be counted toward the component. But then the rest of the question says, does it still play into meeting half of the whole grain? I would have to say yes. Because it's still a grain. Oh, so that's where the black bean brownie recipe comes from, from cooking for kids. Hmm. I know I have some consultants on here with us. Can one or two of you chime in on this black bean brownie? Would it count as a legume, as a vegetable? I'm, I'm hesitant. I would say if you have a standardized recipe and you can show it that uh, I'm going to let the consultants weigh in a little bit on that. So Question, if we feed virtual kids, does the food have to be cooked or we can send it? Um, same rules will apply. If you're feeding those distance learning children, 
and you're going to send home something that needs to be cooked, we're going to recommend that you, you know, first of all, it just be a heat and serve, not something that has to be cooked. Don't send home a box of pasta and a pound of frozen ground beef and a, a can of spaghetti sauce. That, that's not the intent of the program. But if you're going to send home um, a frozen chicken nugget that you're going to have them heat it, you send some safety instructions and you send um, heating instructions, what that needs to be heated to, how long, um, so that you put safety first for your children. So if the pre-K eat in the cafeteria, they can have chocolate milk, but if they eat in the room, they have to have white. Basically, yes, if they eat in the cafeteria and are co-mingled. That's the, uh, the memo says they have to be co-mingled. So even if they're coming into the cafeteria and there's not any other kids around, then they're not co-mingled. Co-mingled would be if your pre-K kids come into the line and then your kindergarten was right behind them. That would be co-mingled. Another question, how do we get the handouts? The handouts are under other documents and cards. You do not have to have a login to get to um, the other documents. You would look under the 2021 school year, scroll down about halfway down, and it is under the trainings upcoming link. What about strawberry milk? Strawberry milk is okay, but if you're talking about feeding it to the pre-Kers, then no, that is considered flavored. So if you're doing distance learning children, you're going, if you are a normal counting and claiming school that you take free and reduced meal applications every year, you're gonna take them this year. So if they're a full paid student, um, they're going to be charged the full price for a meal. So if you're sending home bulk meals this year to your full paid and your uh, full paid price is $3, three times five is $15 for what you send home. And it's gonna be up to your district on how you figure out how to collect money from those. Okay, we're getting off too much into the virtual. We're gonna bring it back just a little bit. Um, if you have these virtual distance learning questions, tune in on Wednesday, August the 5th. So we have a question. If pre-K are not commingled, you only have to, that is true. Thank you, Becky. Um, and we go in, I think, into the CACFP meal pattern a little more. You have to offer one whole grain rich item per day. We have one consultant that said black green, black bean brownie is what is CARS. CARS is our uh, counting and claiming administrator review system. If you don't know where that is, ask your director. Uh, they can get you that link, or we might put it up here in a minute where you can get to it. What if there? Okay, I'm not sure the question. What if they come get their sack in the afternoon? Can they have chocolate? It depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about the pre-K or if they're picking up their meal, um, if you're talking about picking up in this virtual category, we're, we'll talk about that later. But if pre-K and K eat together in the classroom, then they're co-mingled, then you can offer those pre-Kers the K through five meal pattern. Okay, someone said, what if I'm going to ooh, bag the full meal for breakfast to feed in the classroom, cereal meal Monday, can it be white milk in the bag? Uh, you are supposed to offer two varieties of milk, whether you're in feeding in the classroom or not, as of right now.
if you uh, are wondering about the August 5th meeting, that link is under those under in the cars under other documents under trainings upcoming that list is that link is there. Pat has put up our link to the cars website. Yes, when I'm talking about the pre K that is the three year old program in our schools. So if you have a if you have three year olds, that's a pre K that will be what we're discussing when we're talking about the pre Kers being co mingled. Okay, I know we have not answered every question, but we're going to take about a 10 minute break. Uh, I'm going to mute my microphone for just a few moments. Uh, we'll start back up at about 1040. So everyone take a few minute break and we will come back in just a few minutes and continue on with our meet me. Tell my husband to turn the TV down a little bit because I could hear it. I didn't know if you guys could hear the TV in the background. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to look at the meat meat alternates. Hang on, I've lost my ink pen. There we go. I don't know why I need an ink pen. I need something in my hand because you guys see all this. All right, meat meat alternate. We're going to maybe go a little bit faster for a while. I'll, I'll quit watching the chat questions quite a bit so we can go ahead and get move on because it's already 1041. So for our meat meat alternate, you have to serve the minimum amount ounce equivalent at each meal. Um, and then you have to serve the extras to meet the weekly requirement. K through five, six through eight must be offered more than one ounce a day to meet your minimum weeklies. And the smallest amount on a meat meat alternate is 25, 20.25 of an ounce. I'll get that out here in just a minute. And then here we kind of have that uh, slide that shows the K through five, the daily, and then the weekly. Uh, the minimums. Remember, there are no maximums in the meat meat alternate that at first came out um, when the meal patterns when the meal patterns first came out. So your K through five, six through eight have to be offered one ounce minimum per day. But re remember, you have those weekly equivalents. High school ninth through twelfth graders must be offered two ounces a day, and at least the um, minimum for the week. So when you're looking at your beans, peas, and legumes at lunch, they can credit as a meat, meat alternate or a vegetable. The menu planner has to decide in advance how these are going to credit. They can't decide, oh, you know, when the state is there doing a review and all of a sudden you're short on leg legumes, say, oh, that was really a legume, not a meat. That has to be on the production record recorded how it is going to credit if it's going to be a meat meat alternate or a vegetable component. Now just kind of some examples of some things that have meat meat alternate like your beef stew. Uh, if the recipe or the CN label, if you have a CN labeled beef stew, how many ounces of meat meat alternate it may have in it. A pork roast over rice. It may credit for two ounces of meat meat alternate and then the rice would credit maybe a one ounce serving. You, again, you would need a um, recipe or a CN label. If you're going to offer a peanut butter sandwich, a one ounce meat meat alternate um, plus a one ounce cheese stick would credit two ounces of meat meat alternate. And if you're going to use maybe some chickpeas and yogurt um, in a salad as your entree. Those could be considered meat, meat alternates. And then our milk component, of course, milk has to be offered to all grade groups. Without exception, one cup of fluid milk must be offered daily 
five cups per week, and we're still talking about the lunch meal pattern. Uh, if you offer flavored milk, it must be in the low fat varieties, but you have to offer an unflavored at each meal service. And we had lots of questions about the pre-K, co-mingled, talk to your consultant if you still have questions over if your kids are co-mingled or not. But remember, if they are co-mingled, you can follow the K through five meal pattern, but you have to offer the variety of milk with one being the unflavored. And that requirement is the same for breakfast and lunch for your milk components. Again, it's in red that you have to offer that um, unflavored at each meal service. Lactose milk, lactose-free milk is an acceptable alternative if uh, you want to pay to offer that to your students. And again, pre-K students may not have flavored milk if they are being served under the CACFP or child and adult care food program meal pattern. Water, water is very important to be offered during the meal service. You can offer water, you can buy the bottle of water. You know, if you wanna spend the money and buy a little bottle of water, that is your prerogative. If you want to have water in a pitcher uh, and some cups available for the kiddos to do that, but it is not a component and it cannot be a substitute for milk. Um, and the water is not part of the reimbursable meal. So you don't want the water, maybe if you're gonna offer these cute little bottles of water, they can't be in the milk box alongside the milk. Uh, you can't have signage up by your milk box and you know the water and say, choose one. That would make, that would indicate that you could only choose one. Um, it just can't be in competition. It has to be made available. If you have a water fountain um, that's in the cafeteria or close outside, that can work for your water to be offered to your students. And it's a part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that we want to make sure that these kids have access to water during, during our national school lunch and school breakfast program. So it's not just at lunch that the uh, water has to be offered. It is at breakfast as well. They can serve themselves the water, uh, but no one has to serve it. it. It's not something that every child has to get a, a cup of water at lunch. However you find that to work in your cafeteria, that's what you want to provide. And someone, I knew someone was gonna ask about water during COVID-19. We are still waiting on an answer to that question from USDA. What if you have a student allergic to milk? Water cannot be a substitute for milk, even if you, they have an allergy. Um, you're going to provide a milk that meets the requirements for that student um, if they have a doctor's note. So now let's go into our breakfast meal pattern. Breakfast meal pattern is a little different than our lunch meal pattern in that there are, you only have to have three of the five components at breakfast. They are the fruit, the grains, and the milk. We haven't talked much yet about offer versus serve. We've just kind of mentioned it, but just here on the slide, offer versus serve is optional at breakfast for all grades. Offer versus serve is mandatory for your ninth through 12th grade students. And we're gonna have a few slides that really go into a little more detail on offer versus serve. But remember, it's optional for any grade at breakfast. So you have our three components and let's run through those three components at breakfast. Pretty similar to our lunch that you have to offer one cup of fruit to all grades uh, at breakfast. So one cup. You may select, the student could select more than that minimum daily serve, serving size if you so choose. Um, but you have to take into account your calories, that you can exceed your calories, your sodium, and um, 
other nutrients for breakfast. If you're gonna serve juice at breakfast, it must be pasteurized 100% full strength juice, but no more than half of the weekly fruit offering may be in the form of juice. That's the same as in lunch. Breakfast and lunch on the juice is the same. No more than half of the weekly serving can come from in the form of juice. And then like we had in our break or lunch slides, we have in our breakfast. So here's our fruit broken down into our K through five, six through eight, nine through 12. One cup must be offered every day. So if you are not offer versus serve, you are straight serve, you put everything on that student's tray at breakfast, you're going to have to put a whole cup of fruit. And let's say you offer a half a cup of juice every day, so then you're gonna offer a half a cup of juice and a half a cup of fruit in another form, fresh, frozen, or canned. We find that is a problem sometimes during an administrative review. You've offered the fruit only in the form of the juice. You've not offered the rest of the component at breakfast. So I wanna say that again, make sure you're offering that whole cup if you are straight served, that whole cup has to be on that child's plate. So if you are not offered first to serve at breakfast, a kindergartner or even a preschooler has to have a whole cup of fruit at breakfast. Um, the minimum a student must select is a half a cup. So if you are going to be offered versus serve and you offer that half cup of frozen fruit and that half cup of juice, the student only has to have one half cup on their tray. So they could just take the half of a cup of juice if you are offer versus serve. And if you noticed our meal pattern at breakfast did not say anything about vegetables. When the meal patterns first came out, if you were going to offer a vegetable at breakfast, a hash brown. And first you had to offer all of the other subgroups first. Memo came out two years ago and they've kind of extended the memo. Right now, memo SP06 2020 is extended through June 30th of 2021 that you can offer a starchy vegetable at breakfast without offering the other subgroups. So yay, you can offer that hash brown at breakfast without offering those other vegetable subgroups during breakfast. So this slide was already in there, so I, I placed a little blue X through it just to be kind of, you know, just to help you remember that you can offer your starchy vegetable uh, in the in the place of a fruit, if you so choose, without offering those other subgroups. And that is good right now through June, through this school year, through this entire school year. So now let's look at our grain component at breakfast. Again, half of your grains have to be whole grain rich, and the minimum that you can credit for breakfast is a quarter of an ounce at breakfast. That's the same requirement at lunch. Here's just our slide showing the, the different equivalents that you have to have for each grade group at breakfast. Meat, meat alternate at breakfast. Well, you notice when we, I said the three components at breakfast, grain, fruit, and milk, meat was not a one of those. But USDA allows us to count meat, meat alternate as a grain at breakfast once you met your grain requirement. So what that means is if you were wanting to count your sausage patty with your sausage biscuit, you can do that as long as you meet your grain component first. So your biscuit would be your grain component and then maybe you would add a one ounce um, meat meat alternate sausage patty that Breakfast may have counted three grains, two for your biscuit and one for your sausage. And it accounts for your grain component because 
USDA did not make a meat, meat alternate component at breakfast. Um, how you're offering, like, I, cause I just used the example of that sausage biscuit would be three grain um, ounce equivalents. The menu planner is gonna decide up front how they're going to credit the different items. But your staff and students have to know how that is going to be menued. So is that going to be three different items or is that going to just be one, is a sausage biscuit one item? Um, the menu planner has to communicate that with their staff, how that is going to be recorded in your production records. A combination food, uh, like a, a breakfast pizza, that can, a sausage biscuit could be pulled apart. If a child walked up and said, I don't want the sausage, I just want the biscuit. You could pull the sausage off of that or have plain biscuits. If you're using a breakfast pizza, a pancake on a stick, you, they can't separate those. So the menu planner needs to know, are those counting as one item or two items? Uh, especially if you're going to be offered versus served. If the, your product has a CN label or product formulation statement, uh, how that's going to credit. Because you may need to select, uh, a, if you're going to offer like, let's say that breakfast pizza and it has the meat and the grain and you only have to have three components at breakfast and you're going to be straight served, then if that student picks up that milk, then they have that reimbursable breakfast. If you're off reverse to serve, we're gonna get into some of that here in, in just a few minutes. So if you're gonna make some fruit smoothies at breakfast, uh, you may do that. You may put everything in the blender and blend it. That would still be an allowable breakfast. Um, the milk, if you're using the milk, would count. If you used milk and a half a cup of fruit, that could be two items in that offer versus serve we're talking about. And then it's, the student would need to pick up one other item. And offer versus serve, they have to have a half cup fruit or vegetable on their plate at lunch and a half cup of fruit on their tray at breakfast. So in the offer versus serve scenario, if you had the, in the fruit smoothie, the one cup of milk and the half cup of fruit, the student could pick up one other thing and that meal would be reimbursable. And you might want to refer in our um, cars and those other documents is an offer versus serve manual. This manual has not been updated in several years from USDA. Um, you might want to look at that or you may even want to refer to the uh, fruit smoothie memo which is SP 10 2014. So that hasn't 2014 um, that memo is kind of old, but it is still relevant. So if you're going to credit these items as one item or two, so you have a, and we kind of used the biscuit already, a biscuit, it weighs two ounces, so that could be two items or one. That menu planner has to decide if that student, if that's going to count as two, they would only have to pick up one other item, but that would have to be the fruit or vegetable if you were gonna offer the vegetable. So fluid milk at breakfast is exactly the same as it was at lunch. You have to offer all five cups for the week. Um, this has to be fluid milk. You can offer powdered milk. And of course, unflavored has to be offered at each meal service. You still have to offer a variety of milk at breakfast. Now we're gonna get into the slides on what is offer versus serve. Offer versus serve training is required annually. This can be a part of your um, offer versus serve training for this school year. So offer versus serve, what, what is it good for? It allows the students to make choices. It helps eliminate some of the, the plate waste. And kind of my view, my 10,000 mile view of offer versus serve is our children are given so many choices nowadays. If you're bringing them into your cafeteria line and you're putting everything on their tray, 
uh, they look at that maybe as an insult because when they go to a different restaurant, even little bitty kids, you know, two, three year olds, mothers don't just tell them what they're going to eat. They start asking them what they want. So I think we're doing our children a disservice if we are not asking them what they want. Studies indicate that when a child gets to choose what they want, they are more likely to eat what they've chosen than what is just put on their plate. And if you've ever been in any of my trainings, I always say I'm the world's worst. If I walk through that cafeteria line and you put everything on my tray and you have beans, I'm done with the whole meal. I will not eat anything. But if I can choose not to put those beans on my tray, I, I am very good. So um, as the school food authority, you're gonna indicate what grades participate. That's gonna be done by your administration or whoever completes the application in CARS. You have to indicate there if you're gonna be doing offer versus serve. I know this year with COVID, there's gonna be um, schools that are normally offer versus serve that are not going to be offer versus serve because you're going to be sending grab and goes, you're going to be doing um, some different things in the classrooms. There is a USDA waiver because offer versus serve is required for your ninth through 12th graders at lunch. We do have a national wide waiver that waives that requirement for this year. So if you're going to be feeding your high schoolers in their classroom to promote social distancing, if you're going to be serving high school students, grab it and go, we are not going to be required to do offer versus serve this year. If you're normally offer versus serve and you've marked it in your application and agreement, that is going to be fine. And you're going to be feeding your uh, distance learning children straight serve, that is going to be fine this year. We're not going to um, hold that to you. If you're feeding normally in your cafeteria and nothing's changed and you want to continue to serve, use, utilize the offer versus serve option, you are more than welcome to do that for any grade that you've indicated um, on your application and agreement. Here's what we find sometimes during a review situation. Someone in the office has filled out the application and agreement and they've marked offer versus serve at every gate. No one's communicated that to you guys out in the front lines. You've always been straight serve for your first through fifth grade. We come in to do a review. You're putting everything on the tray. We've looked at your application and agreement and we then uh, mark you in non-compliance because you're not following what your application and agreement has indicated. So there has to be communication between whoever fills out the application and you guys on the front line. So make sure you're, you're discussing that with the person who completes your application and agreement. Offer versus serve is not required for RCCIs and it is not allowed if you're doing those, uh, feeding the pre-K not co-mingled the CACFP meal pattern. Um, it's just not allowed in their, their, their menus. So offer versus serve at lunch. You have to offer all five components at lunch. Offer versus serve isn't, well, we are gonna just offer them three of those five items because we don't want to we don't want to open any more vegetables up than what we have to. No, all five components must be made available to every child that comes through the line. So you want to have all five of those up there. A child can refuse two of those five items, but they must have either a half cup of fruit or vegetable on the tray. And they must pick up the other items in the planned quantity size. So you can decline any food item as long as the student has a fruit or vegetable on the tray and the other two items in the plan serving size. So if a child's selection, um, if they do not have that fruit or vegetable and that in at least a half cup serving, that is not a reimbursable meal. So if they've picked up a hamburger patty, a bun and the milk, that may not be reimbursable. 
They have to have that half cup of fruit or vegetable. A good practice that came out with some of our smarter lunchroom um, theories that we had is place, place some fresh fruits and vegetables by the cashier. So if the student gets up to your tray with um, two items and they don't have that fresh fruit or vegetable, you can have them pick up something right there. They're not having to go back through the line to try to get something else. That just makes it a little bit easier for everyone. If the student refuses to pick up the fruit or vegetable, it doesn't matter if they are free, reduced, or paid, or your CEP school. If they refuse, then that meal is to be charged an a la carte price. So if I'm a student and I walk up there and I have a milk and a, um, let's just say a hot dog, no other vegetables, no fruit. And I said, well, this is all I want. I'm a free student. I'm taking this meal. Then your job, if you're the cashier or you're the person responsible for ensuring that meal, that meal should not be claimed for reimbursement under the National School Lunch Program. And it should be charged as an a la carte price. So you may charge $5 for a la carte meal. Even if that child was free, that child would be responsible for paying that a la carte price because they did not pick up the required components. And that needs to be, ooh, sorry, that needs to be communicated to those students what a reimbursable meal is. That's why there is signage that is required to be uh, reimbursable. And this slide just says a student may select more than the minimum to be on their tray. So they could have the whole cup of fruit and uh, you know, three quarter cup vegetable or the, even the whole cup vegetable if they're that high school student, as long as they're, your weekly average menu is not going over the minimum calories, saturated fat, and the sodiums aren't exceeded. So we have another polling question. You guys are doing so good on the polling question. And we are going to, okay. Before I launch it, I'm gonna go ahead and, and let you look at the slide because the slide has our question. It says, which combination of food items from the following offered lunch menu would make a reimbursable school lunch under offer versus serve for grades nine through 12? So offered mint lunch menu, we're gonna have a hamburger on a whole grain rich bun and it credits two ounces of grain, two ounces of meat, meat alternate. There's a half a cup of corn, which our component is a half cup of starchy vegetable. We have a half a cup of green beans, which is a half a cup of other vegetable, one whole cup of grapes, and a cup of fluid milk. Now on the right, meal number one, that student picked up a half cup of corn, half cup of green beans, the half cup grapes, and the one cup of milk. Is that um, meal reimbursable? Meal number two is what you're gonna select when I launch this, you're gonna select the, the meal one, two, or three that is not reimbursable. Because I think my question on my poll was a little wrong. So you're gonna select the meal that is not reimbursable. So meal number two is a hamburger on a whole grain rich bun and a cup of milk. And meal number three is a hamburger bun and a half cup of corn. So which meal would you say, if they come through your line and you were the cashier, would you send them back to get one other thing or have that piece of fruit sitting there so you, they could get something else to make that tray reimbursable? like about half of you have voted. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds. Okay. 
And I see some of you are still are raising your hand. Um, we're gonna have you put your questions in the chat box. Make sure you have to all panelists and attendees. Um, and it looks like, and I'm not sure exactly how you guys see the polling question. So some of you are answering it over here in the chat, which is fine. Um, Somebody says it didn't let me poll. We've only been using the polling questions. We, Gary and I had just kind of started using them right when COVID hit. And then, so we tried to incorporate a few with this one and a couple of our other trainings. So we're gonna end our polling. And then I'm gonna share the results. So if you're looking at the menus, menu number two is correct. That one is not a reimbursable meal because the child did not have a fruit or a vegetable on their tray. Now meal number one is reimbursable because your planned quantity for a high school has to be a whole cup of vegetable. They took a whole cup of vegetable half cup fruit, which they had to be offered a whole cup fruit, but they only have to pick it up in a half cup serving and the milk. So they've actually have three components, a vegetable component in the whole uh, planned amount, which is the whole cup. They took a whole cup of milk, which is the planned amount, and then a half a cup of grapes. So they have their three components in at least two in the planned quantity size. Meal number three is reimbursable because the hamburger bun is served in its whole um, grain component, the meat, meat alternate, which was served in its whole planned quantity size. And then they had the half cup of corn in, uh, which was required to have on their tray. So very good, very good, uh, very good percentage of people that um, got it right. So, you know, give yourself a pat on the back if you got it right. Offer versus serve is one of the harder things to keep in mind, especially um, if you're working on that line and remembering what is and isn't reimbursable. So in that offer versus serve guidance in that 1516 offer versus serve manual, it says water must not be promoted or offered as an alternative to milk. It's very important when complying with this. Signage um, must be up for offer versus serve to tell the kids what is offered, what must be on the tray to be reimbursable. You know, they have to choose three of the five components. So if you're looking for the, men, the memo SP 28 this is what reauthorized in the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act of 2010 that said that water had to be made available to the students during the meal service. Oops, you can't just roll, I changed the slides. So offer versus serve at breakfast. We've talked about offer versus serve at lunch. You have to offer all five components. At lunch, they have to pick up three, they can decline two components. Now, breakfast is a little different. Breakfast, there's three components, but to be offer versus serve at breakfast, you have to offer four items, not components, but items within those three components. So if you're gonna offer grains, fruit, and milk, which is our three components at breakfast, you have to offer one additional item in one of those components, either the grain or the meat, meat alternate, or another fruit or vegetable. And a student must pick up at least a half a cup of the fruit or vegetable for the breakfast to be reimbursable. Remember, if your pre-K students are not commingled, you cannot have offer versus serve in the pre-K meal pattern. So let's look at this menu example. We're 
have out there for the uh, children, one ounce of whole grain rich cereal, a half cup of juice, half cup berries and milk. So if a student only picked up, um, let's say they picked up the whole grain cereal, the juice and the milk, that's a reimbursable meal. It would even be a, uh, because we have our four items, cereal, juice, berries and the milk. At breakfast, they can only decline one item. So they could not just come through and um, pick up two of these four. But if a child picked up the juice, the berries, and the milk, that would be a reimbursable meal because that is three items out of the four items. So some of the offer versus serve choices, um, they, like I said, they can decline one food item. The menu planner must indicate what the different choice and the combinations are. That has to be decided before the meal is actually served. So national school lunch requirements that the signage must be at or near the beginning of the line. Uh, the children need to know what is being offered and what is uh, their responsibility to pick up to make their meal reimbursable. It identifies what is um, in that reimbursable meal and we give you some samples in on pages CM 21 and 22 of some signage that could be used. Then I've just added civil rights poster must be made visible to the public because we don't go into civil rights here today in the um, cafeteria managers. All schools, however, must train on civil rights currently in our Oklahoma EDGE training, the civil rights training is available. You can go out online and take that. We are going to be offering a civil rights Zoom meeting like we're doing today on August the 11th. And I, I've completely lost what time that's going to be. Um, you need, if you want, you can join the Oklahoma EDGE training or you can wait and watch as a group the uh, Zoom training on the 11th. But anyone who participates in the child nutrition program, be they volunteer or paid employee, must have civil rights training. Something I learned through some of our calls with USDA, even your substitutes that substitute in your cafeteria must have at least at a minimum civil rights training. So it might be a good practice before anyone starts working in child nutrition and they're, you're onboarding them. Uh, part of that onboarding training would be to get them the civil rights training on the Oklahoma edge. That's probably going to be the easiest way to make that available. So pre-plated or um, straight serve, however you want to refer to that, is allowable for grades K through eight and all grades at breakfast. Offer versus serve is required for your high school students, but like I said this year, there's some one-offs due to COVID. Um, those daily minimum quantities must be offered. All components must be offered in the plan serving size. Here's kind of the signage I was talking about. You can print and make these signages your own. Um, there are many, many vendors out there that provide signage for you. Uh, I shouldn't say provide, they will sell you some signage. Um, so you can have anything as fancy as, a, you know, a, a neon boil board that runs through your choices every day or a piece of paper that you've handwritten what your choices are. I hate handwritten signs, but USDA just says signage must be available. So prepackaged meals, and we're gonna be, you know, a lot of grab and go meals this year. Offer versus serve, you do not have to do, even in a regular school year, if you're doing a um, field trip for your high school students. You're not gonna try to send 
all the components and so the uh, children you know can pick and choose you're going to put everything in the bag ready for them to go if you're going to be feeding in the classroom it's not going to be required especially this year with your ninth through 12th graders a normal year if you were feeding in the classroom at lunch yes then offer versus serve would be a requirement oh polling question is getting ahead of myself okay so our next polling question and I'm going to let you read it to signage to let students, I have to launch the poll, signage to let the students know what is, it should be, what is a requirement for a reimbursable meal is required at the, is it at the beginning of the serving line, the end of the serving line, you have to post it in the principal's office or by the front door of the building. Where are you gonna post your signage? And we kind of talked about that extensively a little bit there a few slides ago, where you're going to post those slides. Thank you, whoever posted the link to the, I'm assuming that is to the civil rights training on the left. Somebody says, I can't see the polling question. I don't know. I, I launched it. So if you're not seeing it, it, if you're using more than one screen, it could have went to your other screen. Now somebody says, I can see the question. So for you guys that are answering and still with us and still paying attention, because I can't see your faces. If we were in a room, or like I said, we'd have to have the Cox Center to have 700 of you in a room, but I could, you know, know how we were doing on time, how we were doing, you know, if you were needing a break or not. Um, somebody says cannot get the poll. That may be a computer pop-up issue. Not ever had anyone say they couldn't get to the polling question. That may be just a question of your pop-up, Kathy. I, I don't know. All right, we're going to end the polling. Looks like about 67% of you voted. So that means a good 67% of you are still with me and paying attention. So where are you going to post that signage? 98% of you say you're going to post that signage at the beginning of the serving line. That is correct. You're going to you want to post that signage so the students know what they need to have on their tray to be reimbursable. The end of the serving line, I think you guys that marked that, you were thinking someone at the end of the line is responsible for knowing what is on the tray and making sure that meal is reimbursable. That would be correct in that aspect. But the signage needs to go at the beginning of the line. Now we're gonna talk about special diets, uh, medical needs. If a student has a um, disability and of course we're, we're going to talk about the definition of a disability in a little bit but if the student has a 504 plan or an IEP which individual education plan is an IEP you're going to do whatever is in that IEP or 504 plan if that student has a medical statement you're going to feed them whatever is in that medical statement you're going to maintain these medical statements if a parent turns in a medical statement when that child's in kindergarten and they never bring you another one, then you should abide by that medical statement until you have something different. Um, if we were in a classroom, this would be where some of you would say, what do we do when uh, we have a medical statement and mom comes in with the child and it says they can't have strawberries and she says, oh, strawberries don't really hurt them anymore. I would tell you that I would get something from the parent uh, to cover yourself that, that they're, they're allowing that child to have um, an item that you actually have a medical statement on. 
So in the memo SP 26 2017 accommodating children with disabilities, it has our, our general information. It has the definition of a disability, some of those safeguards that you need to follow, what you need to do to request a modification, um, and how to make some meal modifications. If you have a child and they need med um, modification to their, their plan, the best advice I can give you is you or your cafeteria director meet with that parent and that teacher and you have a plan of what they are or are not what they can and cannot eat in your in your cafeteria um, you are not reimbursed any more money for special diets that is just on you as a school district um, what happens if that student is not considered disabled there is some religious reasons you might make meal modifications that is dependent on a school district decision if you're going to make modifications for non-disabled students so what is the meaning of a disability it's really almost anything that substantially limits the major life activities most physical and mental impairment which could constitute an, a disability this includes conditions that impair the immune, digestive, respiratory, neurological, bowel function, skin rash, as well as many others. Okay, if you're looking at that definition, almost all of us at some point have some type of disability. But what you're going to make meal modifications for is if that student has a doctor statement, IEP, or 504 plan. Uh, milk substitutions, you have to substitute milk for milk unless that doctor statement just absolutely says no. All, the substitution rule and the milk rule applies to all of our child nutrition programs. So that's school breakfast, school lunch, after school snacks, special milk, the child and adult care food program, summer feeding, seamless summer, any of those programs that fall under our jurisdiction, you follow the same guidelines for special um, dietary plans. You're gonna, like I said, you're gonna follow the plan if it's one of those IEP 504 or doctor statement. If it's just a milk substitution request, so the parent comes in and just says, oh, Junior just doesn't like milk. I want him to have juice every day. That cannot happen. Juice is not a substitute for milk. But if your district so chooses and you mark in the application and agreement that you're going to make milk substitutions based on the parent request, you're gonna to wanna to get documentation. And we have a form in the manual that you can use to have that parent sign. Um, you're going to want, like I said, mark that in your statement. The milk is going to have to have the same nutrients as milk. So if you're just going to substitute, it's not going to just be um, water for the milk. You cannot use offer versus serve to um, sub just say, well, if you don't like milk, just don't, just don't take the milk. That can't be used. If they're co-mingled, you have to provide the milk substitution if that's what you marked. So like I said, water and juice is not, not, cannot be a substitute. And then under, like I was saying, under offer versus serve, the meal could be reimbursable without the, the milk, but you can't advertise it that way. So if you know, you know, your, your parent comes in to talk to you and just says, you know, Junior doesn't like milk. You can say, well, ma'am, sir, we're offer versus serve. Um, the child does not have to pick up their milk. They, you know, they can pick up the other components if they would like. But if you've marked in your application that you are going to provide that, then you as a school district have to provide at your expense that other milk. So those nutrients that are, you're going to have to provide if you're going to provide a milk substitute for those non-disabled students, they're going to have to meet the same nutrients as in cow's milk. So this slide, and I believe it's on page 
CM 121, what the most difficult part of this is, is the protein. You see here on the slide, you have to have eight grams of protein per cup. If you're looking at some of your soy milks, your almond milks, they do not provide eight grams of protein per cup. A lot of your uh, almond milks provide two grams of protein per cup. There are a couple of milks out there that do provide the eight grams of protein, but they are more expensive than your normal carton of milk. So that you need to keep in mind if you're going to provide that, that that expense is on the district, not on the parent. So we're going to go to our sixth polling question. I'm going to launch the poll. This question is, if my district offers, is offer versus serve, I can tell it my student they do not have to take the milk if they have a milk allergy and a doctor's note that says they cannot drink milk. Can I tell them this, yes or no? If they have that doctor's note. Okay, you guys are still answering. I know we've been about a minute and a half. I'm gonna let it go for just another couple seconds. So if you haven't got your vote in, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. We're gonna share the results. So about 85% of you say, yes, you can tell that. Did you miss the part that said, and the doctor's note says they should not drink milk? Hmm, that might put it in a little different light. The answer is really no. You cannot tell a student that has a doctor's note that they can just not take the milk, even if you're offer versus serve. You might hint to them, but you cannot not have a milk to offer them because then technically you are only offering four of those five components at breakfast or two of those three at five. Of, no, I just said that totally backwards. You would not be offering all five components at lunch because you're not offering a milk and that would be the same at breakfast. You're not offering that milk component because you had the doctor's note. Now, if the doctor's note just said they shouldn't drink milk at all, then you would be covered. If the doctor's note says, um, well, you know what? Now that I have all 700 of you in front of me, you would be correct. Because the doctor's note just said they should not drink milk. Hmm, you guys are way smarter than I am. I maybe didn't read my question very well when I typed it up. You are exactly right. If you answered yes, you are correct. That was really a trick question. If we do cafeteria managers again, we will change that question. You're right, Mandy, the doctor's note states they should not drink it, so we are covered. You are exactly correct.
and it's good to have interact because these are things that really come up in schools. So let's go over, well, it's 1130. Let's go a few more minutes and we'll see where we are and we, um, see where we are after a few more slides and we'll, we'll take another break. All right, menu planning tools and some tips. So on pages CM 24 through 29 is some menu planning um, information. It's some forms that breaks out the meals into um, where you can break them out yourself and where you can see them. It has those shorter and longer weeks. If you need um, those shorter or longer week meal patterns. One of the, the tips we can give you is a cycle menu. So what is a cycle menu? It's a menu that offers different items daily but repeats on a certain time frame. So you may have um, a three week cycle menu that you offer this Monday through Friday, this the next Monday through Friday and these menu items the next week, then they just repeat the next three weeks. You can um, build a cycle menu however long you want it to run for. I've seen three week, um, two week, that doesn't really give you much variety. Um, I've seen eight week cycle menu. It, it helps you with some, some different things. It can save you some money because you know uh, what you're having. It helps with the grocery ordering. It, it is appealing to the students. They know what's coming. Um, in most cycle menus, you can have flexibility with those. And if you are a um, numbers person and you pre-cost your menu, you would want a cycle menu. You're not gonna wanna get up on uh, Monday and think, oh, what am I having next week? As a food service director, you love cycle menus because then you know what your plan is. You've got uh, order plans, you've got inventory control, it helps those employees know what they're having in advance. They're not calling you going, okay, Dana, what are we having uh, Monday? It's Wednesday and I need to turn in a grocery order. You know, that, that is a stress level that you don't necessarily need to have if you have a cycle menu. It helps also those people that are working at your point of sale, um, point of service line, what is going to be reimbursable. You're not changing that up because you're making the menu on the fly, so to speak. Now, what are production records and why are they important? If you've been through a review, you know why production records are important and uh, you know you need to do them. Looking over some of the findings that have come from the administrative reviews, has to deal with production records. Production records are required by USDA. It's a, a tool for planning, ordering and preparing um, how you're gonna serve your menus. It's a source of information that helps us know from the State Department that you met your, men, your meal pattern requirements. It's a record of those foods that were prepared and offered to your customers in the correct quantities. Um, if you've recorded the, the production record wrong, you may have, uh, we may have taken back money because you just recorded it wrong. Production records are used as a forecasting tool. I like to tell people that production record can be done parts of it in advance. And the, the theory behind that is if your production record is you know, the, me the menu plan, how much you need to prepare for is all put out in the production record beforehand. You have to have a substitute come into your cafeteria and cook lunch or breakfast. They have some guidelines to go by. It's kind of like a substitute teacher. They don't go into a classroom that the teacher hasn't left some kind of lesson plan. 
this is your lesson plan. This would be an example that I can use in McAllister. Um, a time or two, me or my secretary had to go serve lunch or breakfast. We didn't necessarily know how many that particular school fed. So that production record was already there. We looked at it and we could tell, okay, this school feeds normally 200 kids. Uh, I need to open this many cans of green beans. I need to open, I need to thaw out this many pounds of ground beef to make spaghetti. It's a tool. It is a very important tool that you use to prove what you have provided, especially in a review situation. But just more than that, for your everyday um, plans, it's your lesson plan. So what needs to be on the production record? They need to be kept up to date, first of all. Production records aren't something that um, should be filled out a week later, two weeks later, the week before the state ladies coming or the state persons coming. Right now we are all, the consultants are all women. Um, do you have to use the State Department of Education's exact form that we have in the CARS other documents? No, as long as you have all the information that is on ours, you're welcome to use if you're using from a, a, a um, computer system. If you are made up your own because you like it, maybe you like eight and a half by 14 pieces of paper, so you write out everything. Um, however you do it, as long as it has the, what is the minimum that's on ours. So your columns should be completed correctly. It should have the total quantity of food prepared. It should have what each of those uh, meal patterns, what they contributed. You can keep temperature and time on your production records or keep it separately, but you must keep your food time and temperature recorded somewhere. What grade level that plan is for, what those plan serving sizes are, what's the requ not just the required, but what did you serve? Did you serve a half cup of green beans or did you offer a whole cup of green beans? The plan numbers of servings. If you're going to be feeding adults a la carte meals, contract meals, those in that plan. What you did with your leftovers, if, you know, put that in the comment section. And then last but not least, go back and put how many you actually served. What is your, what you served of each of those components and the actual number of reimbursable meals that you're going to be claiming needs to be on there. Here is a sample of a food production record. This is what we just made a copy out of our manual. This is also in an interactive form on the CARS website. So if you wanna save it, it's in an Excel form. You can type into it if you uh, like neatness and you know, want it to be all pretty. If not, it, you painted it to the cook and you said here, fill it, you know, keep this recorded. Some things I'd like to bring your attention to, as you see down at the bottom, is kind of a little key. In column D on here is where you're going to put what that um, menu or food item, what it contributes for. Is it a meat, meat alternate, a fruit, a vegetable, grain, um, or a milk? If it's a vegetable, is it one of those dark green, red, orange, green, leafy? Uh, what it contributes. It's very important that you um, indicate up at the top if you are offer versus serve at this grade level, um, if it's a breakfast or a lunch. Then in that box there on that upper right hand side, that's where you're going to come back and put how what you actually fed, how what your reimbursable meals. Oh, sorry. Here is a production record completed. Um, it's got, they have offer versus serve, yes, grades two through 12. So this obviously probably is one cafeteria, but they house, um, looks like a pre-K through 12th grade because the pre-K column 
we made a column for that over there on the right hand side. You would want to fill that out if you were offering um, that meal. Those children are not commingled, so they have to follow that CACFE meal pattern. Go back and look at our chicken nuggets under the menu on column A, chicken nuggets. You're going to want to list chicken nuggets. You're going to want to list that CN label if you didn't make those chicken nuggets fresh from scratch. Um, you want to list how many pounds you used. Please don't just put chicken nuggets to two boxes. Chicken nuggets come in a 10 pound box, 20 pound box, 50 pound box. Um, that CN label number, the consultant would go pull that to see how many nuggets that it took to meet the meal pattern. Your CN label, we're gonna talk a little more in depth about what a CN label is, but that CN label is going to tell us so many of these nuggets equal a so many ounce meat meat alternate, so many ounce brain uh, serving size. So we need all that information. Um, another thing we find is a lot of times somebody will say um, meatloaf. I think even the USDA recipe is a little confusing because it says one pan. We need to know how many servings that was. Um, the more detailed they are, the better. I did find an error when I was going through um, because the chocolate chip cookie you see about midway down, column D, the X stands for extra. Now, I just went over this morning that uh, the chocolate chip cookie, because it's a grain-based dessert, cannot be counted as an extra. It's going to count towards your grain components. So that really is not an extra. So this meal, um, would have a grain there, a grain with the cookie, and a grain with the hot roll. So you would need to keep that in mind in meeting those grain requirements for your whole grain rich. So what happens if you have a food bar? Food bars are wonderful. COVID-19, we're recommending highly that you not have food bars where little hands are touching everything and after each other. But in a normal year, uh, it allows you to have a wider variety of offerings of vegetables. It can lower plate waste because like I said, on offer versus serve, if a child can pick and choose what they eat, they're more likely to eat it. Um, menu planners must, you guys must know if this food bar, salad bar, whichever, is going to be part of the reimbursable meal or if it's just going to be served as an extra. Your cashiers must be trained. Um, to what is and isn't a part of that reimbursable meal. If it's located before the point of service and you can count it as part of that reimbursable meal, that is a wonderful way to get your all your uh, subgroups in for the week. You know, if you have uh, leaf lettuce out there every day, then you know your green leafy is fulfilled. If you have um, a starchy out there and you know to sliced tomatoes, in those planned serving sizes, then you know it's, it's, you're meeting those requirements for your vegetable subgroups. This year with COVID-19, salad bars may not be an option. If they are, I know some health departments are telling you guys to prepackage, cover so if a kid, you know, they need to take what they touch, but things are covered up as a, as a general rule. You need to do a food bar or salad bar production record, even if it's not part of the reimbursable meal. We have to know what was out there in the plan serving size, because that is still a part of the nutrient analysis and as a part of your calories, saturated fat, and your sodium. So even if you have a um, yogurt bar at breakfast, that needs to be noted on your production record or on a bar type recipe. And you see it's built similar to your um, food production record in that you have the food item or the menu, the meal contribution, it has a place for time and temperature, how much you put out there, how much was left over, and basically what you did with it. Here is a example and that is also in your manual. So you would really want to um, have all of this detailed I'm a big proponent of having the, uh, the bar before the point of service 
so that you can count it as part of your reimbursable meal. First of all, the food cost on that, um, you're, if you're just giving it away, so to speak, that's not um, helping your bottom line. Second of all, then you, it helps on meeting those subgroups of all of your, your vegetables and your fruit. It's not something that you have to be behind the line in the normal year of serving it. So on that food production bar, you have to include, if it's a meat, meat alternate, a fruit, a vegetable, grain, and signage should be clear. If it's gonna be a part of that reimbursable meal, what the students can and cannot have to make that meal reimbursable. So now we're gonna look at one more polling question. Maybe, here we go. So our question is, why should you complete a production record? Because it's required by USDE to record the amount of food prepared, offered, and served to students and adults. Number three, so my vendor will know how much to bill me each month. Or just because I love to do paperwork. How many of you just love to do paperwork? You're in the cafeteria because you love to do paperwork. Somebody put in the chat, love to do paperwork, not. And what people don't understand, and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but they think, oh, child nutrition, I can just go buy some groceries and feed the kids. They do not have a clue how much paperwork is actually required of us and you guys to serve a meal. It's almost unreal of what we have to do to serve and be reimbursed for meals that are served. But we do it because we love what we do. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. I tried to trick y'all up a little bit. USDE is not USDA. It's the, um, I don't know, I just kind of made up school district of education, not the US Department of Agriculture. So if you answered that one, that was kind of a trick question, but it is, you have to do the production records to record the amount of food prepared, what was offered and served to the students and adults. So very good on the um, polling question. Now, I have a very important question and I'm not real sure how to ask this because it is 10 minutes to 12. We are three quarters of the way through. So in the chat, I'm gonna have y'all quickly say, do y'all wanna take a 30 minute lunch break or do you wanna take about a 15 minute break and come back and finish? So I'm seeing lots of 15, no break. I saw one, two thirties. One wants a 158 minute break. Okay, y'all, you can probably stop typing. It looks like about the 50 minute break is going to win. Here's the thing. Um, it, some of you I know, you know, we have health issues and stuff that have to have something to eat. 
I'm going to give everyone about a 10 to 15 minute break. We're not looking at you. So if you want to bring your lunch back and sit down at your computer and snack while you're doing that, that will be fine. Um, Cause we have a little bit more information to get through. So it's 1154. So plan to be back by about five after, well, let's do 10 after 12. 10 after 12, we'll pick questions. Um, what someone asked about a four day school week and do they offer five cups of fruit? And if you go to CM31 on that four day, um, on that particular page, on that four day meal plan, you will only have to order, you'll have to offer four cups of fruit. Um, once again, there are several questions asking about water. As Dana had told us earlier, we're waiting for, for USDA regarding the offering of water as far as that's concerned, just so that you're aware of that. Um, the other thing too, one of the questions was asked about pre-K students coming into the, the lunchroom. What, in their particular site, it appears that their pre-K are there, but then their pre-K are there, and then also the other students come in even though the pre-K are there first. My, from USDA's understanding is, and what we understand as well, is that if the pre-K are even there for five minutes when the other students come in, then they do not have to provide the pre-K meal plan. You can find them with the regular plan. Am I correct, Dane, on that one? They don't need yes, to that consider commingling. That would be so, commingling. That is considered commingling. commingling. Another question was, do you have to offer a bread component with a smoothie? If the bread component is not within that smoothie, you would have to at breakfast because that is something that is required at breakfast, those bread offerings. Um, the other thing too, another question was civil rights training regarding like volunteers, et cetera. If they're working within child nutrition at all, even as a volunteer, you should go ahead and have them go through that civil rights training. It's a pretty short training overall and they need to go and have, and have that training. Another question was, if you are serve only, do you need signage? Um, my understanding is yes, they do need to have it, even though it is, because you wanna let the kids know what they're getting in their meal. So that signage does need to be there, um, and as far as that's concerned. Again, there were several questions regarding virtual students. Do you have to feed them? We're trying to get it back from USDA. If you do have to feed those students or not, so tune in to our COVID-19 training and see if we've heard anything about that as far as that's concerned. Um, now, the another question was when it comes to allergies, um, that form, if you have it filled out and signed by a doctor, do you have to renew it on a yearly basis? Um, USDA does not require it to be required on a yearly basis. That is up to your district on how often you require that to be renewed. Um, Another question was if you're have, if you have offer versus serve, and if you offer milk and the student does not take it, does that still count as one of the three items at breakfast? Offering it is what you have to do if that, but they still have to have three items on their tray, as far as that's concerned. Um, and another question was regarding an IEP: if the child needs lactose-free milk, you will need to provide it, as far as that's concerned. When it's specified in the doctor's statement, you don't necessarily have to go with the name brand they have, but you do have to provide um, that meal substitution within a reasonable amount as far as, that, you know, as, far as needed. Um, those are the key questions I had. Hopefully I answered um, the main questions that were in that chat. So um, that's it, Dana, for me. If there's anything else you wanna keep going. Okay. I um, a couple of other questions that I kind of glanced through and saw, and I think Becky Gilbert answered a, an individual school asked her, did they apply for the waivers that are available now for this coming school year because of the COVID, you apply for any waiver through your area consultant. So just make sure we're all aware of that. If you're going to do the offer versus serve, you're going to have grab and go, you're going to not serve at the um, normal meal time, uh, meal times. You're gonna apply for the meal time flexibility waiver. 
all of the waivers, the consultants have paperwork that you will have to complete and send back to them. So make sure if you're gonna do anything different than normal feed the kids through the lunch line and feed them in the cafeteria that you apply for the waiver through your area consultant. Um, and I've noticed some county health departments, we've been telling school folks on the last several COVID calls that they need to check with their county health officials on how they're going to do self-serve bars. Um, even I noticed ketchup packets may be an issue. You don't want, necessarily want every little hand getting in that container of ketchup packets. So you, you know, those may need to be handed, put on the tray. Um, things like that, that you're gonna have to do a little different this year than you normally do in your school lunch program. So keep that in mind. Sherry's posted again, the CARS website. <clears throat> and remember, you do not have to have a login to get the, what we're, what we're telling you to go in the other documents. You will look on that gold bar on the left-hand side once you uh, get to that website. You do not have to have a username or login. Scroll, it's about halfway down under other documents. You can get to the last, I don't know, four or five years that we've had cars, get to all of the uh, information that we put out for schools. It, that's, uh, most of that information is on the State Department website, but we keep everything that we make available to you guys there on that cars, other documents. That very top line will have the school year. So make sure if you're looking for something in, that's already been posted in the 2021 school year, that you look there. If you're looking for something in the last years, you change that to 2019. Okay, well, we're gonna continue on. This slide should just be our question that we just finished. So let's let's look at some of the tools for the, for the kitchen manager. We're gonna look at the food buying guide. Uh, we're gonna break it down a little bit on how to use the food buying guide. What is a CN label? when you should have a CN label, what's a product formulation statement, and standardized recipes. First, let's look at the food buying guide. Most of you know now the food buying guide, uh, you, know, you can still get it in a paper format. We have that link in that other documents in cars that if you want to print your own. It's also interactive on the website, on their website. You see that website there that you can go to, uh, that you can download your own to print. You can uh, save that link and use it on your computer. It, it makes it real, real handy to have. You can save favorites in there. Um, you can do many different things. One of the neat things is you can even have the food buying guide on your phone. Now, I don't know if you can actually see my little food buying guide icon right there on my phone, but it brings it up where you can do a, a word search and there, poof, you have the food buying guide at your fingertips. Uh, and what I usually tell people Every one of us almost carry one of these in our back pocket or we have it pretty close. So you have the food buying guide at your fingertips. So what is the food buying guide? It lists the items, how you would maybe want to serve them that you do not need any more definition to be able to serve it. The food buying guide tells you how many servings you'll get from a specific quantity of food. Example, ground beef is a raw item normally. You buy it raw. Of course, ground beef cooks down. So this food buying guide tells you if you buy a pound of ground beef and it's 80, um, 20, 80% lean, 20% fat, you cook it, you're going to get on average 11.8 one ounce servings because it shrinks. It also helps you to know how much to buy 
for 100 servings. And we're gonna look at that in a little more detail. But in order to use the food buying guide, the label has to read just like it does in the food buying guide. Uh, if it does not, or it's a process type item, you're gonna need a product formulation statement or a child nutrition label or what we refer to as a CN label. So this is how a paper documented uh, food buying guide, it has six tables. The food as purchased, the purchase unit, servings per purchase unit, what it contributes to the meal program, the serving size, and then how much you need to buy for that 100 servings. And then that column six is for any additional information. Um, and we're gonna have some examples of this. USDA, it's all about the label. So if it's not labeled just like it is in that food buying guide, you need some other way to know how to contribute that item to the National School Lunch School meal, even um, at risk, after school program. Whatever meal program we have, that food buying guide is there for us to use. So if an item does not have a standard of identity, this is where we're gonna use that CN label product. And there's an example of a CN label on page CM39 or a product formulation statement that is provided by the manufacturer on CM42. Um, most every grain, I shouldn't say grain, your fruits and vegetables are um, in the food buying guide. The red, orange, green leafy um, subgroups, I just lost my train of thought there. The subgroups are listed in that food buying guide to help you quickly identify what it is you're needing. So here are some examples of foods that do not have a standard of identity. Raviolis, fish sticks, breakfast pizza. As you know, there's about as many different breakfast pizzas and different pizzas as there is grains of sand. So you would have to have a CN label or a product formulation statement to show what that contributes to the meal pattern. So what you're gonna look for is um, the label. And here on the screen is that USDA checklist for a CN labeled product. I think that was that website. I'll leave that up there for just a minute. If you're taking pictures or remember, you can print these slides off at a later time if you didn't already before the presentation. This is a creditable, authentic CN label. What you're gonna look for in a product that is CN labeled, most generally that CN label will come on the box. It will be in a square or rectangle type um, print. It will have CN on all four sides of that label. It will specifically tell you, like this one on the screen says this five ounce pizza with ground beef and vegetable protein provides two ounces of meat, meat alternate, an eighth cup serving of red orange vegetable, one and a half ounce equivalent whole grain rich, whole grain rich grains for the child nutrition meal pattern requirements. So that tells us and you that that pizza, if you're serving it to a high schooler, that's your two ounce meat, meat alternate requirement for the day. However, there's only an ounce and a half equivalent of grain. So to offer that high school student two ounces of grain, um, you're gonna have to add something with that, a breadstick or a, a piece of toast, something to go along with that. A CN label also will have this statement like you see in the parentheses below that it'll say, it's authorized by the Food and Nutrition Services, USDA, and it's going to have a month and a date. If you are diligent about getting the new CN labels and you think, well, I got that, I'm using that same chicken nugget I've used for the last 10 years. It shouldn't, the CN label shouldn't change. CN labels change, they have to be updated. Um, they expire now. Uh, and if you're not familiar with a CN label product, 
what happens is the manufacturer has to go to USDA and apply for that product to have a CN label. They have to pay extra money and go through the specific steps of getting that item approved to be a CN label product to be used in the child nutrition programs. So if your item CN label doesn't appear just exactly like this one, it may not be an approved child nutrition label. All right, this website is the commodity product information uh, sheets on your commodity products. You wanna look at those products to verify uh, how that product contributes to the meal patterns for the child and adult care food program, national school lunch, school breakfast, all of our programs. We all have uh, commodities or CACP gets cash in lieu of, but your school meal products are there in that commodity um, website. Product formulation statement is something you're gonna get directly from the manufacturer. You're not gonna get it from the vendor. It's, they're going to have to use the food buying guide to have a product tested, weighted, what it measures and how it contributes to the meal pattern. If they've not used the food buying guide to follow the exact steps that are listed in that product formulation statement, even though you've gotten a product formulation statement, it may not be correct. So my advice to any school that's wanting to use a product formulation statement before your administrative review team gets there to do a re administrative review, I would send my product formulation statement to either my consultant or to us at the State Department and let us look it over and make sure that item is a creditable item. Just a little note, this Nutrient Facts is not a CN label. It's just the nutrition facts that's on the box. And you have to really watch sometimes manufacturers uh, will put a stamp on a product that says um, good for child nutrition programs. That doesn't necessarily mean it is a child nutrition CN labeled product. It needs to be that exact label that we showed on the previous slide. And I'm not sure I actually said this out loud, but a product formulation statement and a CN label are only necessary for items that are processed. Fruits and vegetables are not processed. You do not need CN labels on fruits and vegetables. Um, just kind of making sure that that was said. So a standardized recipe, a standardized recipe is needed anytime a, an item contains more than one ingredient. So it gives an example on the screen of green beans. If you open the can of green beans and you pour them into your steam table pan and you add whatever tablespoons of butter, a teaspoon of salt and a tablespoon of pepper, that is now a recipe because you have changed the uh, nutrients that were in that original can of green beans. So you would need a standardized recipe even of this. Um, a standardized recipe is going to tell us how many it yields. Now in that green bean example, the yield is not going to be any difference because that little dab of butter and the salt and the pepper did not change the yield factor. You need to make sure you know what your serving size intent is going to be and um, the ingredient, if it's going to be in the form of frozen, fresh, canned, what the fat content is, if it's packed in water, syrup, uh, fruit juice, if it's a canned fruit, what the measures are of that product. Completed the, the prep and serving. You want to list all of that so if someone's coming in and following the standardized recipe after you, they know what steps to take. The critical control points, what is it going to be cooked to? What's the holding temperature? And if you know, you're know you a larger school district, you may want to number your standardized recipes so that you can find them easily um, for use at a later date. 
In our manual, we give you a blank sheet that you can work up a standardized recipe. We also give you an interactive form if you would like to do. It just helps because when you're making a standardized recipe and you're using all these numbers and stuff, uh, this Excel spreadsheet will help you in the multiplication uh, of making that standardized recipe. Then in the food buying guide, there's also a recipe analysis workbook. I've not personally used the recipe analysis workbook. I would really uh, like to. I did a webinar last fall on the food buying guide. If you really need some help with the food buying guide, I'd go back and watch that webinar. I didn't get into the recipe analysis, but uh, hopefully maybe we can get to that if we ever go back to, to normal. Um, but the online food buying guide has lots of information, more than just the products listed. Now the next few slides are left in here. We were gonna take these if we were meeting together and you would take these, rest, these uh, food buying guide pages and a standardized recipe form and we would have you work up what a standardized recipe look like and how to actually work it. But what we're gonna just kind of walk through today is how to read the food buying guide. So let's just look at those pinto beans. It says, so we were gonna serve um, some dry pinto, canned dry pinto beans. So our um, as purchase column, that column number one says beans comma pinto comma dry or comma canned. And that includes the USDA. So a number 10 can, which weighs 108 ounces, that's in column two, that's our as purchase. So it says that you can get 37.2, then you have to scoot over to the column number four, one quarter cup heated drained, uh, quarter cup heated drained beans from that number 10 can. So if you were going to be serving 30 students a quarter cup of beans, you would know you would need one number 10 can. Okay, child nutrition, school programs, we don't typically use a quarter cup. We use half cup uh, or a whole cup. When we were before all the electronic things and we had just our paper food buying guide books, I went through and marked out and changed all of mine to a, changed mine of the things we use to a half a cup. So, you know, you divide 37.2 by half so you can figure out how many half cups you could get out of a number 10 can. Just something you can do if you would like, but that's how you read that. Then in column five for the purchase units for a hundred servings. So if you were gonna need a hundred quarter cup servings of these pinto beans, you're gonna need at least 2.7 number 10 cans. Well, you can't buy 0.7 of a can. So three number 10 cans to serve a uh, hundred kids a quarter cup serving. So real quick math, if you were gonna serve a hundred of them, a half cup, you're gonna need six number 10 cans or a case of those pinto beans. And then the ground beef example that I was talking about a while ago, look at the, pop, the bottom, and this has our beef ground, fresh or frozen, no more than 20% fat. So this is your 80-20 ground beef. And as you can see, you normally purchase it by the pound. So in column three, that's that 11.8 one ounce servings. And it goes over and the additional information says one pound equals about a 0.74 pound of cooked meat. So for every pound, you get just a little under three quarters of a pound after you've cooked and drained it. And if you were going to need 101 ounce servings of ground beef, you're gonna to need to buy 8.5 pounds is how you would read that. And like I said, this was going through for a standardized recipe for spaghetti, so you would need that ground beef. Cheese typically credits an ounce per, um, per ounce. Like um, let's look at, 
at oh, then we change screens. In that second group, cheese substitutes includes or reduced fat. So if you have um, cheddar cheese, you're needing, you will get out of each pound, which is 16 ounces, you will get 16 one ounce servings. Now, if you were going to serve cottage cheese, which is a cheese, but notice because cottage cheese is kind of a processed cheese, out of a pound of cottage cheese, you're only going to get eight two ounce servings, which only provides one ounce of meat, meat alternate. So that is something you would need to pay attention to in your food buying guide. And my computer just flashed that my internet service was unstable. So if I break up a little bit, it's because my internet, I live out in the country and um, sometimes we have limited, limited internet service. And in the standardized recipe, it had you looking up the tomatoes can. So out of a number 10 can of stewed tomatoes, you get 45.5 quarter cup heated vegetables and juice. So you would use everything that was in that can. Um, crushed tomatoes is a little different than your whole or stewed tomatoes. So you're going to want to find the product that matches in the food buying guide exactly. And I think in that recipe was some diced onions and um, I believe they used some corn chips with it, but anyway. So now that we've kind of um, gone through and talked, we've got another polling question. So our polling question says, all items that are served in the national school lunch or school breakfast programs must have a valid child nutrition label to count as a component. All items that are served. All right, I'm gonna end the polling. Looks like the voting has slowed down quite a bit. And then we will we'll launch that. Oh, maybe I'm gonna launch it. There we go. Share our results. You guys that answered false, you are correct. You only have to have a CN labeled item if it's a processed or mixed dish and it's not found in the food buying guide. And then I, I, I can see the chat question. There's a person that said the grocery salesperson told me this year that the products will, they will not have CN labels on most products. So what do we do? I'm not sure why they would be telling you that 
they're not going to have CN label products. As far as I know, um, that has not changed as far as USDA goes. We're not going to allow you to have items that are not CN labeled products if they're not found in the food buying guide. Um, you need to have a conversation with that salesperson and maybe even that salesperson's boss if that is going to be an issue for your school district. But there is a waiver this year if you, um, for meal pattern flexibility, but that meal pattern flexibility is only if you cannot get components. It's not going to be for if you're short of employees or you can't find uh, styrofoam items to serve with. So keep that in mind. But I would be, um, that I would be very interested in who your salesperson was that were telling you they're not going to be getting CN labeled products. Um, we can investigate that a little further and talk to USDA and see if they've actually heard anyone having issue with CN labeled products. Okay. I didn't mention, someone asked the question, can we pull CN label products from the manufacturer site? Yes, that's called a watermark CN label. You can do that, but we will want to see that and your um, invoice at the time of administrative review to show that that was the product you actually did purchase. All right, safety and sanitation. You have to make sure all the health and safety standards are being followed. We've kind of discussed that a little bit with the food bars. Are you going to have food bars? What can the kids touch, not touch? Safety inspections. Um, at a minimum, your, dis your school sites must be reviewed by your health department at a minimum of twice per year. If for some reason your kitchen is not inspected twice, you are responsible for contacting the health department and requesting those inspections, even if they don't, because like this year, they did not allow their inspectors to leave after COVID-19 hit. All we ask is that you send an email to your local health department and request the, the uh, inspection and they emailed you back and said, we are not doing any inspections at this time. That's the documentation we want you to keep. Even if you have to answer in the CARS application that you did not have the correct number of inspections, you have the backup documentation. These food safety inspection reports that you get from the health department must be posted in a, the public area. They're not to be posted on the cafeteria manager's bulletin board back in the kitchen. They have to be uh, published in a public place. If you notice most of your restaurants, you can find their health inspection posted where you can see them. You want to have your, your written food safety plan, your HACCP plan. Uh, HACCP stands for Hazardous Analysis Critical Control Points. It is your standard operating procedures written down. It is one of the questions on the administrative reviews. We want to see those HACCP plans. We want to see that you are uh, using those HACCP documents. But make sure you're following what your plan says. If your plan says you do a food safety uh, visual inspection once a week and you document that, make sure you're, you're following up with that. Because if you're not following your HACCP plan, then that could be an area of non-compliance during an administrative review. USDA foods, um, how we base the amount of money that you are given in donated foods is it's based on the number of reimbursable lunches you served the preceding year, which I know uh, Jennifer Weber, our executive director has been in communication with Gina at Commodities on what numbers we're going to use because it, normally does not include seamless summer or summer feeding numbers. 
And um, since we all quit serving lunch last year in March, obviously our national school lunch reimbursable meals will be down. Um, so they're working with USDA on using the year before numbers, I hope is what we're going to be able to use. The commodities are housed out of the Department of Human Services. Their phone number there is on the screen if you need to get a hold of them for any reason, or their website there at www.okdhs.org. DHS re requires you to keep refrigeration and freezer temperature logs. Um, if you have a refrigerator or freezer that goes down and you lose product and your temperature logs are not done or you know, that you steadily been going up in temperature and you didn't stop and have something repaired, you are liable, your district is liable for those products that you lost. You could have to reimburse DHS for those products or show that they were replaced in kind. Um, you have to keep a perpetual inventory of your commodity items. Perpetual means daily in and out sheets. We do give you a um, sample of an in, a perpetual inventory for your commodities in our manual. Commodity processing, if you do commodity processing, what that means is you take some of your raw item and you divert it back to the manufacturer to make a processed item. Um, a good example is potatoes. You can divert so many dollars worth or so many pounds of potatoes back in and receive french fries for that. Or maybe you send back in some of your pounds for your raw chicken to convert it into some kind of chicken patty or chicken nugget that your kids uh, consume better than what they do the normal um, commodity processed items. Do you keep a purchase inventory? It is required. USDA requires us to keep at least a monthly inventory of our purchased goods. If it's Inventory is a good way to keep you from over ordering. It helps with the efficient cost of your um, program. It helps control the theft. We hate to say that there is any theft that goes on in the um, school world, but we know that is not true. That, that, that is just an extension of the rest of the world. Um, it can control who has hands and that you're not overstocking. Um, someone was saying the other day they knew a same order every week. Every week was the same exact order. And when that person quit, they went and there was just pallets and pallets of items because they just ordered the same thing every, every week. Inventory is necessary if you ever have a natural disaster and you have to turn things over to the insurance for fire, flood, tornadoes. And we know in Oklahoma, we can have any of those at any time. Uh, it helps keep your control of your cost and helps with your fin overall financial health of your kitchen. Now let's talk a little bit, we've, we've talked about the CACFP meal pattern for those kiddos. And this is just the memo uh, information that the final rule that the, the CACFP meal pattern how it related to the Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010, that um, even though these children were in attending public schools, they were going to have to follow the CACF female pattern. Sorry, that was putting a glare on my screen. Um, so the just saying that the school operators must comply with these updated meal pattern requirements for children on the CACFP meal pattern. We've talked about the no flavored milk. So if your children are not co-mingled, they cannot have flavored milk. Grain-based desserts, um, they cannot use as a component. You can have them, but it's, in the meal pattern, it says on a limited basis. Breakfast cereals can have no more than six grams of sugar per dry ounce. The best way to know if you're having to follow the CACFP meal pattern and you are offering cereal is you go on the Oklahoma Department of Human Services 
WIC website. That will give you information on the cereals that are approved. If that cereal is on that approved WIC site, then it is the six grams or less of sugar per dry ounce. If you're using the yogurt, the rule there is no more than 23 grams of sugar per six ounces. Typically in a normal school year, we would give you a handout that would have some cheat sheet uh, about the different size yogurts and how many grams of sugar they can have. You can find those on our website in the CARS other documents as well. So this is talking about the memo, the flexibility memo, the 372017, which is still in effect. Um, and we, we've talked about it quite a bit. Oh, probably question. All right, I think this will, will be our last polling question. So if my cafeteria is feeding pre-K students at lunch and they come into the cafeteria, eat and leave before the kindergarten arrives, I can follow the national school lunch meal pattern. This is just lunch. And I realize some of you are answering in the chat because evidently you're not seeing the polling question, but I think that has to do with your pop-up blocker on your screen. All right, we're gonna, if you haven't voted, put your vote in. You have nine seconds, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, we're gonna end the polling. And it looks like about 77% of you say false and about 24% say true. So the answer is false. If those pre-K are not co-mingled, you have to follow the CACF female pattern. So if they come in and leave before anybody else comes in that cafeteria, then they are not co-mingled. But if they come in and the kindergarten comes in right behind them or the kindergarten, they're still at their table and all the kindergartners coming in, then they're co-mingled. If they come in and leave, then then they are not commingled. Oh, okay. I thought I was trying to share the poll and it wasn't doing anything. All right, so we're going to move on to our unpaid meal charge policy. And normally we talk about this in ABVM, but we mention it here in cafeteria managers as well for the simple fact that um, you in the cafeteria should know what the charge policy is for your cafeteria and for your school district. So as of July tw 27, as of July 2017, it says all SFAs must have a district charge policy. We're from the State Department are not going to tell you what needs to be in that charge policy. We're, we're just going to tell you you must have a charge policy and that our area consultants do review that during the administrative review. We're not going to tell you if it's right or wrong, but we are going to write up if you are following your charge policy or not. This policy ensures that the school food service 
professionals, administrators that um, have a shared understanding of what the policy is. And then that last bullet says this policy must be distributed in writing to the students and parents yearly. Um, and that is a question on the administrative review. We wanna make sure that those parents and students all know what that charge policy is and what's going to happen if they don't have money in their account, if they don't have money in their um, hand to pay for a meal. Now this school year, we know that you may not be able to completely follow your charge policy if you are going to be offering grab and go meals and feeding outside of the cafeteria. Uh, this year is just gonna be some unique situations but you should have the policy. It should be administered and known to the students and staff in your, in your school district. After school snack program, after school snack program is different than uh, what some of you do on the CACFP at risk after school meal program. The after school snack program is a part of a national school lunch program it can only be claimed on days that school is in session. You have to do an on-site review of this two times per year, once during the first four weeks of operation, and then one more during the school year. Um, right now, there's still an educational component that has to be offered with the after-school snack program that has not been waived. Join the COVID call Wednesday to find out more information on if that's going to be waived for this or any other uh, enrichment. Any other meal program that requires the enrichment component. Normal school year though, if you participate in the national school lunch, you can offer the after school snack program. If you are in a site that is more than 50% free or reduced, you can feed the snack, after school snack, to all students and are reimbursed on the free rate. If you are not 50% or more free or reduced, you can still feed the after school snack program, but you would claim the meals in whatever category that child is eligible for, free, reduced, or full paid. You can either feed them all at no charge and um, claim them in their right category, or you may charge them if you so choose. The contents of the snack can be found on page C10. We're gonna look at those meal requirements here in just a second. The snack must be eaten on site. You cannot allow, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um, the after school snack program allows you to serve children ages um, through 18 or 19 if they are still currently enrolled in your school. Record keeping, that's on page C9. You still have to keep documentation if you are 50% um, or more free or reduced. Low income report to show that you're eligible. You have to keep your attendance and meal counts. You have to do food production records. So no getting out of doing food production records for this and then keep those on-site reviews. The on-site review doesn't need review twice a year. Here is a um, look at the meal pattern. It actually falls under the CACFP meal pattern, so there are four components, milk, vegetable fruit, bread, and meat, meat alternate. So you have four components. The school snack, after school snack program says choose two of the following. You cannot be offer versus serve at this program, so you're not gonna offer all four when they choose to. You only have to put out two components, but the child must, and when we say must, that is absolutely, without doubt, must do, take two of those components. One does not have to be the milk. In other words, you could offer a bread and a meat and let them drink water or whatever else, but the components for the snack program would be the bread and the meat. And you see here, it is also broken up into age groups. So you have children ages one to two, three to five, and then 
in an elementary school and you want to offer those children three to five years that age group meal pattern you see it's a little smaller servings maybe not have as much waste a lot of the schools that do the after school snack program feed everyone because there's no calorie limits there's no saturated fat there's no uh, trans fats there's no sodium requirements in this program so you can always feed more you just cannot feed less the minimum amounts are what have to be met for the after school snack program if you're up for an administrative review these are some of the documents you may not be the keeper of all of these documents but these are the documents an area consultant would come in and um, be required to look at and or make copies of to take with them for review purposes And I will say an administrative review, right now we're on a five-year cycle. So if you're up for an administrative review, you're also going to have a procurement review. It's a separate review, but it is on the same review cycle as your administrative review, unless you're with a food service management company. If you're with a food service management company, then the procurement review will happen every three years. That is regulatory at this time. And these are some of the items that um, will be looked at during in a procurement review. Currently, we have an audit firm that are doing our procurement reviews. So you will be notified at the first of the year by us that you're up, first of all, up for a procurement review and the name and email address and information of who will be contacting you from the audit firm to receive and get documents for that procurement review. Some of you have been made aware that we um, are undergoing state audits and the state auditors now need to look at everything we look at during an administrative review. They of course, pick just a certain percentage of the schools that we look at for an administrative review and a procurement review. We have no idea who it is they will pick. So we will be gathering information that normally has not been gathered and taken, um, saved, scanned, taken pictures of. So if the consultants seems like they're um, wanting information and scanning and taking more time with that this is the reason why because we are required to do that from the state auditors now cooking for kids i know some of you have been on um, some cooking for kids trainings they are doing webinars uh, similar to this i uh, know i've been on a couple of different calls and things seem to be going really really well and um, I hope you guys have, have been able to utilize some of their trainings and uh, have learned a lot. Now, just a, a nutrition information contact, your area consultant that is it's on page C3. If you need to know who your area consultant is, you would find your county and that will give you your um, area consultant. Of course, our state office number up there and our national school lunch email address that is checked by three or four different people in our office at any given time. Of course, you can always reach out to um, myself. Kendra is the director of training. Sherry is our uh, office consultant. So she is there to answer any questions as well. Now, that's all we have for today. Yay. Someone asked on here, how many hours of training are we going to have? We've just gone four hours. We will probably give five hours of training because by the time we do uh, some other questions here um, and answers, we will go over the four hours. So I always like to give a little more to you guys. I thought I could do the presentation in four hours. I know when I do it live, I can give it in four and I talk really fast. Uh, I'm gonna work my way kind of back. How are you gonna get a certificate? 
you're going to, if you registered for this class, you will get a certificate. I will email those out. If you have other people watching with you, you are more than welcome to print them out a certificate. The certificate does not come with your name on it. Okay, Sherry, you wanna break in and see if there's any questions that I have not caught and answered. Okay, um, one of the things to, oh, we've had some questions over the waivers. They are individual waivers. And just because you apply does not mean you necessarily are approved. You have to get a letter from your area consultant. Now, consultants, if I'm wrong in what I'm telling them, let, chime in and let me know. But um, just make sure that each of these waivers are separate. You have to apply for them separately. Um, when it comes to unpaid meal policy, it is still with COVID-19. It's still there. That's a question. So there's not been a waiver regarding that policy, so it's still there. Um, how do you know if you're up for review? Um, there's a couple ways you're going to know is if you know the year you were last reviewed and see if you're up for review. Oftentimes, your well, your consultant will be reaching out to you if you are up for review. And um, as far as that's concerned. Also, too, I just want everyone to know there is a page. Sherry, that it, Sherry, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sherry, yes, Sherry, uh -huh. you're breaking up really bad. Oh, I'm so sorry. It must be my connection. I'm Can you hear sure. me better? It may be. No, you have a, it's like a static anytime you talk. Okay. Okay, well, what she was saying, I, I'll kind of go ahead and just try to do here um waivers for this next school year you apply each separately there is a form you need to complete for each waiver you're going to be participating in or using uh, you can contact your area consultant and they will get you the information that you need to do that um if the okay the the reason we're only doing five hours for this is, well, for one, it only took four. We're still gonna give you five, but there was also a procurement training. There was a wellness, smart snack, other thing. Those are out there online. Um, we haven't posted them yet, but they will be. There will be ways to get the rest if you're required to get six hours of continuing education for your professional standards. Um, professional standards that was on that one okay we're not doing salad bar we're going to offer okay that'll be good something's going on. okay we knew that thank you guys for the prayers good luck on you guys starting school um oh someone was asking how do you know if you're going to be up for an administrator review we have a list that your consultant will be contacting you shortly after school begins, if you're going to be up. Um, they have their own list and can adjust that list. You can actually be reviewed at any time. So, you know, the five year is, is a, I guess a guideline. If there was any problem, uh, we have to have risk assessments with our audits. So if there was different findings in, you may be having a review quicker because there was a risk assessment. I said certificates will be emailed. Oh, I miss you guys seeing you guys too. I'm a people person and looking at just the computer all morning has been kind of, um, kind of different. You no longer have to put your commodity process items in your USDA book, correct? That you will have to ask the commodity people. I'm not sure on that. I thought you had to still track your commodity process items. Okay, if you have a Head Start program on site that eats in your cafeteria and they are co-mingled with the school students at breakfast and lunch, do the CACP guidelines apply? No, if they're co-mingled, Head Start are, are Typically, if the Head Start is enrolled in your school district and you're claiming them national, under the National School Lunch and School Breakfast Program on a normal basis, you're gonna feed them your meal pattern, not 
the Head Start program meal patterns. Okay, oh, Tim, any messages? Okay, let me scoot down here. Do we have to serve our virtual learning students? Remember, they're not necessarily virtual. I know schools are calling them virtual. There is a difference between virtual and distance learning. We are trying to find out from USDA if you must offer meals to distance learning students. Can we use civil rights training towards as well? If you attend the civil rights training, yes, that is a part of our training programs and that counts for your professional standards. You didn't answer my question about salad bar paperwork. If you're gonna offer a salad bar, then yes, you have to keep these. I'm not sure what your question was, I missed that. Do we have, okay. Good luck to everyone, someone said. Yes, good luck. Our area consultants allowed to come on site for technical assistance or not. This is what our office has put out. If our consultant feels safe and they are not immune, uh, immune compromised, then they can come on a limited basis. If they um, have any reservations or in that age group that they could be compromised, then no, they do not, we're not encouraging them to go on site. If you need um, maybe a face-to-face, -face, maybe we can, uh, we have some Zoom account that we can let the consultant, maybe you two Zoom together um, to do more or less a face-to-face -face meeting. We had an administrative review last year. We were told in the meeting last year we could be having this, having the audit this year. So two years of USDA, hmm, yeah, um, that could be, several reasons a consultant could be rearranging their schedule and trying to get things figured out, or if there was a risk assessment involved in your review, then yes, you could be reviewed every year. I would think it would go on the, if it's not just a regular bar, it could go on the regular production record, yes. Okay, if you if a group of you watched, you can print certificates for each of you. Okay, if Head Start claims the meals, then yes, you're going to, if, if Head Start is contracting with you, the school district, you're going to feed them whatever meal pattern they're supposed to have, because that is then on them, because they're claiming and you're just billing them for the meals. Now remember, when you bill Head Start, you're going to bill them bill them the free rate plus the commodity rate plus the seven cents. On our production record, whole grain rich is what we use to credit whole grain rich. So if it's a regular grain, should we just say grain bread? I would. Can you give us a link to easy finish for the one hour? join civil rights next week on the 11th that would be a quick and easy way to get um, one more hour can you post the cars website again you girls that are have that up can you post the cars website one more time your screen is showing Oh, are y'all seeing my email? Huh. There. <laughs> the training on the 5th is the uh, COVID update. And yes, we have been sending out certificates for the COVID calls that we've been having. How do we print the certificate? It will come on an email um, attached and it will say um, cafeteria manager training, five hours on, what's today, 
July 30th. Oh, today's the last day of the month. Yes, everyone have a safe and wonderful, wonderful year. I know this, you know, we've heard the word unprecedented how many times now in the media, but um, you guys in the cafeteria world have gone above and beyond, above and beyond. And I, I praise you and I thank you so, so much for all you guys do.